16 p.m. And I would like to ask if the city attorney would please report out a closed session. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, there are no reportable actions taken um, in closed session. Okay, thank you. The time is 6.16 p.m. and I am adjourning the closed session meeting. And uh, for the benefit of the public, I received a request from a member of council to have a couple minutes to use the restroom. So we will, we are just a minute or two behind schedule, but we will start this meeting um, when that member has returned. returned I am going to yep let's do this okay so the time is 6 18 p.m. Sherry are you ready I am thank you okay thank you the time is 6 18 p.m. today is Tuesday April 5th 2022 I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Emeryville City Council for a special study session Please note that during the COVID pandemic and pursuant to Governor Gavin Newsom's order in Assembly Bill 361, Emeryville City Council and its uh, other affiliated agencies and boards are meeting via teleconference um, pursuant to exemptions to the Brown Act that have been authorized under Assembly Bill 361. Members of the public can still visit City Hall. There are opportunities to uh, find the times and places for um, the different uh, I'm totally out of turn here. Uh, the counters, thank you. Uh, the counters to visit City Hall if you need to visit planning or building. Uh, if you wish to participate in this meeting via teleconference this evening, you can do so by um, following along on the agenda online. There's a link on that page to join this meeting via Zoom. And if you are joining us via Zoom, there will be opportunities at each point in the agenda for public comment. There will be public comment on each item as well. If you are here with us via Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature. And if you're joining us by telephone, you can press star and nine, and that will signal to the clerk and I that you wish to be called on for public comment. Uh, you can also submit electronic comment cards by going to the city's website under the agendas page and clicking on the link to submit a comment card. And the clerk will read that electronic comment into the record at the appropriate time. Uh, with that, I would like to ask if the clerk would please call the roll. Council member Donahue. Here. Councilmember Martinez. Here. Councilmember Welch. Here. Vice Mayor Medina. Present. And Mayor Bowders. Here. Members, the next item on the agenda today is to approve the final agenda. And I would like to uh, ask the city manager if she would uh, join me in uh, talking about the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, staff does have a request this evening that the marketplace study session um, be continued to the April 19th meeting in light of uh, written comments that were very recently received. Staff would like the time to review uh, those comments and uh, research them further to provide you uh, the best possible analysis. So we would, we would request that you um, continue that item to the April 19th meeting as a study session. Okay, so members, I'm gonna make a motion to approve this agenda. I just want you to hear that now for um, information purposes. When we reach the relevant item, I will uh, be entertaining a motion to continue the item after public comment. Okay, so I made a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second to my motion? I second. Okay, there's a motion by the mayor and a second by Vice Mayor Medina to approve this agenda. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue. Aye. Council Member Martinez. Aye. Council Member Welch. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. The agenda has been approved. We're on to ex parte communications. I'm going to call on each of you for ex parte communications for the agenda items on the study session. 
starting with Vice Mayor Medina, do you have ex parte communications to report? Uh, yes, I spoke with representatives from the public market regarding agenda item whatever point one. Okay, Member Martinez? I don't have anything to report, thank you. Okay, Member Donahue? Yes, I spoke with uh, representative of the marketplace development. Okay, Member Welch? None to report. Okay, and on item 6.1, I have had meetings with the uh, representatives of the public market, and I've also had meetings with Wareham Development, and that would be, and uh, on item 6.2, I've had a meeting with Supervisor Carson's office. Okay, so that ends ex parte communications. Now is the opportunity for public comment for items not on today's agenda. If you wish to speak for an item not on the agenda today, you'll be afforded one minute to do so. Are there any hands raised? I see none. Is there any one just went we have? up? I'm sorry, what's that? One hand just went up. I'm sorry. Yeah, I saw that. Um, so please recognize Brian Donahue for one minute for public comment. Go ahead. Okay, I heard I just heard the uh, the city manager say that the public market item is not it's going to be continued because the city has received comments and that the city, the staff wants to read the comments, analyze the comments to, to make a, to, in order to have a, make a more, um, a better presentation to you. That's why the, the item has been discontinued as just reported, except that begs the question, uh, well, how come you haven't done that in the recent past to, the city staff I'm asking now. Uh, last meeting I made comments and you just shined them on. You didn't even include the comments at all in the in the um, staff report or in the staff presentation. So that my comments didn't enter into, weren't considered at all by you. So is it, what's the story here to the city manager? Is it some people's comments are more valuable than others? Some people's comments have no value at all. Is that, how do you determine whose comments have value and whose don't? So I'd like to hear the metric that you use to make that determination about whose comments you're gonna to listen to. So I'll take my answer uh, while I'm on mute. Has the clock expired, Madam City Clerk? Yes, it did. One minute. Okay, I couldn't hear the clock, just so you know. Um, okay, is there anyone else who wishes to make a public comment for an item not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll now move to our study sessions. We have two on the agenda today. Item 6.1 was a study session for the marketplace redevelopment parcels A, B, and F. And as noted by the city manager, a letter was received uh, earlier today with which staff uh, has asked for additional time before presenting this item so they can provide appropriate responses and inform the council on the item. So members, there's no presentation. I'm seeking to waive presentation. Does anyone object to me waiving presentation? Okay, seeing none, any member of the public who wishes to comment on this item will have one minute to do so as there's no presentation. Please recognize Mr. Donahue for one minute. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get an answer to the question about this item. You're, the staff is listening to somebody that's commenting and elevating those comments to such an important high level that you're continuing the, this, this discussion to a future meeting. But then when I made comments about an, an agendized item at the last meeting, it was, not only was it not elevated, it wasn't even allowed to enter the the, the uh, public purview at all. The, the the staff hid my comments from the, the council member uh, decision makers, and so it just it, like I said, it begs the question: Why are some people's comments listened to, and other people's comments are not listened to? You're supposed to be providing objective analysis, as you just said. Uh, city manager. So is that objective? I don't, I don't get the objectivity that you're referring to. That's one minute. Okay, the time has expired. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Is there anyone else who wishes to comment on item 6.1? Okay. Seeing none public comment is closed on this item. Members, is there any discussion? I would like to make a, a member Martinez. 
Oh, I was just going to move the to continue the item to April 19th. Thank you. That's the motion on the table. Is there a second to this motion? Second. Okay, there's a motion made by Member Martinez and a second by M Member Welch to continue this item until April 19th, 2022. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue. Aye. Council Member Martinez. Aye. Council Member Welch. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye, thank you. The motion passes. This item has been continued. Item 6.2 is a study session on the Adeline sites, and I will turn it over to city staff. Um, Mayor Bowders, this is Charlie Bryant, Community Development Director. I believe that Valerie Bernardo, our housing coordinator, will be making the presentation on this item. Thank you. Welcome, Valerie. Hi, good evening, Mayor Bowders and City Council members. Um, I'm Valerie Bernardo, and I'm the housing coordinator. And I'm here to seek feedback from the city council on how they would like us to proceed with three city owned parcels that I'm going to refer to throughout the study session as the Adeline sites. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so about 20 years or more ago, um, the redevelopment authority of Emeryville began acquiring land along Adeline and 36th street with low mod housing asset funds in an effort to assemble land for a future affordable housing project. The three sites that were acquired is site number one, which is 3602 Adeline street. It's 0.029 acres located in Oakland site number two, 1122 36th street, which is 0 0.012 acres also located in Oakland and site number three, 1122 36th street, which is 0 0.009 acres located in Emeryville. And you can see the location of those three properties on the um, parcel map that is in front of you. Just for uh, reference, um, I thought it was important to identify that in Emeryville, the parcel in Emeryville is located within the mixed use residential south zone, also located within a transit hub. And then parcels one and two, which are located in Oakland, are um, a mixed housing type residential zone, also known as RM4. Um, it's in a transit accessible area and a part of the West Oakland priority area. Next slide, please. Uh, for better context, you'll see an aerial photo on the screen. Um, the red star that's somewhat in the center there is the location of the Adeline sites. And for reference, you'll see um, Interstate 580 and 36th Street lie to the south of the property. Adeline Street and the Ambassador Apartments are to the west. San Pablo Avenue and Estrella Vista is identified on the map to the east. And then the Pack and Save Grocery Store is identified to the north. Next slide, please. For more context, I've provided you guys with some street views of the properties surrounding the Adeline site, which vary in size and in use. Um, in the picture at the top left corner, you can see a two story Victorian single unit immediately to the left of the Adeline site, and then some smaller one level bungalows a few houses down. Um, you can't see it in this picture, but also further down the street are some commercial properties. Um, further down on Adeline street, they should also be noted that the parcel. Um, Parcel number three um, actually is directly behind that Victorian house on Adeline Street. So the three parcels that we have kind of form an L shape and parcel number three actually sits behind um, that Victorian property on Adeline. In the picture to the top right, you can see the parking lot of a commercial property that's located on San Pablo Avenue that's immediately behind the Adeline site. And you also can see the top of the freeway um, running um, parallel along 36th Street. And then in the picture at the bottom middle, you'll see um, the street view directly across from the Adeline site, which consists of some small one level bungalows and a multi story uh, multi family structure, which is the ambassador apartments. So this will give you a little bit of context for what's going on on the street level um, for the Adeline sites. Next slide. So now that I have hoped to provide you with a little bit of a better understanding of where the sites are located and the existing conditions surrounding the site, um, I also wanted to make you aware of some additional um, things that need to be taken into consideration when we decide what the next steps are going to be. Um, as I mentioned previously, the Adeline sites were acquired with low moderate income housing asset funds, which does restrict what we can do and how fast we need to determine what those next steps are. Um, first, the funding requires the site to be developed for affordable housing. 
or we're going to have to take the proceeds from the sale of the property and deposit it back into the low mod income housing asset fund. Additionally, as a successor agency asset, we must initiate development on the site by September 1st, 2022. Um, so we have a little less than six months in order to make sure that we're initiating development, whatever it is we decide that we're going to do. Secondly, um, in 2019, um, Assembly Bill 1486 and Assembly Bill 1255 made changes to the Surplus Lands Act, which now requires all local agencies to notify the state of its surplus or exempt surplus property. And then we also have to identify and notify interested housing sponsors before we actually dispose of the land. Staff in conjunction with the city attorney is um, needing to continue to determine whether or not the Surplus Lands Act will apply specifically to this property. That determination has not been finalized, but that's something that we just need to think about in the back of our mind. Um, and if we do decide to move forward with redevelopment of the property and the Surplus Lands Act does apply, then that will just adjust how we do um, the RFP for the redevelopment of the site and the de developer solicitation. And then the third item for consideration is in 2021, when the city council approved the affordable housing bonded administration and expenditure plan, we did identify this asset in that plan and we had set aside $240,000 out of the bond for the redevelopment of the Adeline sites. So on the next couple of slides, I'm gonna present a variety of options for the city council to consider um, related to the Adeline site and thank you. Okay, so option number one is to sell the vacant land, um, deposit the proceeds from the sale in the low mod income housing asset fund and reallocate the housing bond funds that have been reserved for the site to another project or program. Next slide, please. Option number two is to solicit a developer to build a detached single unit house. Um, that house can be created into a home ownership opportunity for a household between 80 and 120% of AMI and can then become a part of our BMR portfolio. Or we could opt to partner with a nonprofit entity that's looking to manage a low income co-housing rental opportunity for let's say a special needs population. So you could potentially have seniors, veterans, disabled individuals who would each reside in the single unit property and each resident would have their own bedroom but would have a shared living kitchen and outdoor space. Um, under each one of these opportunities, whether we go home ownership or rental, um, the housing bond funds that are set aside for this project could be used to help subsidize the construction of the house um, or to reduce the sales price to make it more affordable. Next slide, please. The third option is the development of a two or four unit residential structure, also known as what's called missing middle housing. It's a very popular term right now. Um, missing middle housing is defined as house scale buildings that feature multiple units that reside within a walkable community. Um, as we identified on the first couple of slides with the pictures, this property is clearly in a transit hub, whether you're on the Oakland side of the property or in the Emeryville, it's very walkable and convenient to transportation as well as to grocery um, and other um, service amenities. So the Adeline sites could support the development of let's say a stack duplex, which is what's shown in the picture on the far left, which would create two units. Um, you could have a triplex structure, um, which is shown on the second um, structure or, I'm sorry, the second picture or the fourth picture. The picture number three actually is showing a modular four unit property. Um, that could be something possibly of consideration. Um, all of these units could be um, programmed out in various ways. So we could decide if we wanna go with the missing middle option that we want to have all of the units for home ownership opportunities. So that would be targeting households between 80 and 120% of area median income. We could make it to where all of the units become <coughs> rental opportunities for households between 50 and 80% of AMI. Or we could um, design a program to maybe where the entire structure <coughs> is sold to an individual. <coughs> I'm sorry, my dog is barking. Um, <coughs> The entire structure is sold to an individual as a home ownership opportunity. So there would be a requirement that they live in the property, but then maybe they convert, the other two units are then converted into rental investment opportunities. 
and there would be a restriction on who they could rent those units to. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to the three options outlined, I also wanted to point out that there could be an opportunity um, to create an accessory dwelling unit on the site. Um, and the reason I think that that could be something that's a bit, that's something we may want to consider is because it'll expand our housing options and create a more dense housing project. Um, as a side note, I did want to just identify that the state is requiring all jurisdictions to come up with a policy and a program to incentivize the development of accessory dwelling units and the cycle six of the housing element. So if the city determines that we do want to require the development of an ADU on this site, in addition to one of the other option number two or three, um, we can then chronicle the construction of that ADU as a demonstration project and incorporate it into our ADU, ADU marketing materials to show people how you can build an ADU in Amoryville. So that's an additional option that we have at your hand. Next slide, please. So I'm available to answer any additional questions um, that the city council has in regards to um, the site or the three options that I've presented. Um, but again, I'm here to seek direction from the city council on how they would like to move forward with the Adeline sites. And I've identified five questions for the city council to consider. And with that, I will turn it back over to Mayor Beth. Thank you. And I took a screenshot of those questions so I can ask them again later when we come to discussion. Um, members, do you have clarifying questions before we go to public comment? So no, no discussion. Member, Vice Mayor Medina. I have a couple of questions. Um, they might be dumb. One is how come neither Oakland nor Emeryville um, use these vacant parcels for their site inventory list? Do you have any sense of why? Um, I would say most likely because they're extremely small. Collectively, the three parcels are 0 0.05 acres. Um, and so I have checked with Oakland and I've looked back at ours and nobody's just identified it. And again, I think it's just because of the size of the property. Okay, thank you. And my second question is, if we build housing on these properties, whose RENA does it get counted towards? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, that something will, it probably would be split. I think when we've had projects that like Estrella Vista and a few others that are split between Emeryville and Oakland, the units are actually split amongst the two jurisdictions. So there are some units that we are able to count and some units they're able to count. We, we don't collectively each count all of the units and we would have to do the same thing on this site as well. And with the, that split happening, is that based on geography? Like if we build, let's say all of the units in Oakland, except for one ADU, would we just count one and say like four apartments in Oakland? Um, you know what, that's a great question. And I don't have enough background to know how that's been determined in the past. That might be something that Charlie may have some additional insight or that we may have to look into. I, Thank I you. believe that in the past, the rule has been that it's whatever city it's in. So it is geographical. The, the city that the units are in get counted towards that city's in, city's arena. So the if we built a unit on the Emeryville parcel, that would get counted towards Emeryville's arena. If we built units on the Oakland parcels, those would get counted towards the Oakland arena. That's my understanding of how it's worked in the past. Okay, thanks. Member Welch? I just had a clarifying question about the home ownership rental option. Um, who would be providing, the city would still be providing oversight, correct? Because my concern is a homeowner going rogue and moving folks in. And we're taught, if we're gonna be talking about folks 50%, 60% AMI, folks who are on the lower income scale, I'm concerned about um, some rogue eviction type stuff going on and them us moving the folks in initially and then them getting evicted so they could get higher paying tenants um, into those units? No, oh, that's a great question. Um, and so with anything that we would control through some type of um, affordability agreement, um, there would be requirement for the owner of the property or if it ends up becoming all rental units for us to do some type of compliance and some type of reporting back to the city. Um, several years ago, we did have a rental rehab program where we provided funding to people to um, renovate properties that are then rented out. And so we do require them to submit reports to us to ensure that they're renting them to 
affordable tenants and that they're charging them an affordable rent. And that same type of um, restriction would be put on a property if that option was decided by the city council. Thank you. Member Donahue. Has the city ever measured our staff time for developing affordable housing on various projects? And uh, if we have, has there been an analysis for staff time on this project per unit? Not that I'm aware of. I, I may have to punt that question. I, I'm not aware of that either. I, I think though also to clarify the staff up to this study session haven't been doing work on this project member Donahue. There's this is, if you'll recall at the January meeting, um, I requested a future agenda item for this pro this study session. Uh, this is one of the remaining redevelopment agency sites and I wanted, it was slated in the long-term management plan to simply be sold and we had never had a discussion about it. And I have some ideas when we get past questions, which some of which are presented in the slides that we received. So staff haven't done any work on this other than uh, Valerie and Charlie's work um, with with others, I'm sure, and staff um, in preparing the options that are available to you. There hasn't been any time spent doing any work on this project or site. Okay, Member Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Valerie and Charlie, if the, uh, the units end up falling in Oakland and they get to count it as the arena, are we still doing the compliance if we go that route? Yeah, typically on the other projects that we've had where we have a regulatory agreement, we do require um, reporting on all the units. We don't actually segregate out that these units are Oakland and these are mine. So we do require on all the units. It could be something that we also coordinate. I think we have one project where both Oakland and the city have some type of agreement. Potentially there's funding opportunities maybe that Oakland has that wants to invest in it. And then they would also have a regulatory agreement and we would work collaboratively together. Okay, understood. Thank you. Okay, anyone else with questions? Okay, seeing none, now is the time for, before we have discussion, now is the time for public comment. Members of the public who wish to comment on this um, study session item will have two minutes to do so. So you have a comment on the Adeline sites, you'll be afforded two minutes to do so. Sherry, did you receive any electronic comment cards? I did not. Okay, we have one hand raised right now. Please recognize Brian Donahue for two minutes. Insofar as Charlie Bryant is the manager of these sites, I have to ask, why would we do that? Charlie Bryant, and since he's been working here for like 30 years or something, every, he's got the anti-Midas touch. Everything he touches turns to shit, at least from the resident's perspective. So I can remember like him, him guaranteeing like for instance, Pete's Coffee, when they moved their headquarters there, we were gonna get a retail component at the site. Oops, didn't get it into writing. Charlie forgot to put it in writing. And then when it came time to get the retail component, they just said, nah, we changed our mind. Same with Icon Apartments. We were supposed to get a cafe in association with that project that Charlie was managing. Oops, didn't get it into writing. So when it came time for our cafe, the developer said, nope, we changed our minds, we're not gonna do it. And then more recently, the, the cluster fuck of the tree so at the Lennar project that, sh that Charlie put his, had his hands tied up with. So, so taking our trees away from us in the most cynical manner possible. Everything he touches, he screws up. He, does, he doesn't work for us, he works for developers. So insofar that Charlie Bryant is the manager of these sites, I have to ask the five of you, why? Why do that? I, I think you should have the people's interest at heart here and not the developer's interest. And insofar as Charlie's the manager, that's, it's gonna be the developer's interests are the interests that are being assuaged here. So, you know, it's, it's time to move on. You know, we, we're, you know, we're, we'd like to have the people's interest be looked out, looked after for a change. Get Charlie out of the picture here. Hey, are there any other members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Okay, seeing none, public comment is now closed. And members, um, before we take general comments, I'd like to, if I could, navigate us through the questions Valerie provided us for the discussion. So uh, 
the threshold, well, actually, you know what, maybe I should just allow for discussion first so we can all hear from one another before I ask you to weigh in on these items. Do, you, do folks have initial reactions or thoughts that they'd like to share? I, I will as well after others have. Member Medina. Oops, all right. Um, always interested in building more housing in the city of Emeryville, a little concerned about, uh, you know, building sites in Oakland. Historically, we've been against developing Oakland property. So um, just a little cautious about that aspect of it. So to be honest, the stats re staff's initial recommendation would have been in our plan of selling the site makes sense to me, um, but I am open to other creative ideas. And I, you know, I do think missing middle housing is, is very appealing. Thank you, Member Martinez. I'm very interested in uh, maximizing the potential of this site. And if, if we just sell it, someone could just turn it around as a single family home. Um, we have had successful partnerships with the city of Oakland. Estrella Vista is a, a whole huge development that um, is partially in Oakland and partially in Emeryville. And the, um, there, it wasn't without complication, but the developer, I would say, handled most of that. Um, so, you know, whatever we can do at this site to um, increase how much housing we have. And I think an ADU would fit on that um, parcel three. Um, they're kind of perfect for that. So those are my thoughts. I saw your face during the presentation. I was, I was sure you would be keen on that. Others have initial comments? Uh, Member Welch. Just that also just seconding the, the, the missing middle. I also like the potential option of having both uh, a homeowner option and rental options just because we get such a wider range of, of incomes available to live on one site altogether. So I think that's um, something I, I found particularly interesting, um, but definitely understand the potential challenges of of partnership, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's something that um, we we would be able to to navigate successfully and also co-sign on the ADU. Member Donahue, do you wish to speak now or wait? Uh, yes, uh, you know I'm a little a little concerned about the amount of effort it would take our staff. We're a little short-handed, and we have some bigger housing sites to really be concerned about. So, you know, I'm feeling that perhaps, you know, while the missing middle housing and part ownership, part rental, all that looks good. Uh, it just looks like, I don't know if we really can deal with all of the complexities of this small project at this time. So I, I asked for this item to be on the agenda. It is in the long range management plan to be sold. And obviously option number one is we could just simply take back the $240,000 we've put aside um, as potential bond expenditure money for this project and put that into another housing project in the city and um, sell this at a public auction. I don't know what this small compilation of lots, if you've walked past it and I've gone over a number of times, what it would sell for, I have no idea. but. Um, I don't think it would be a lot of money, to be honest with you, just because of the constraints on the property itself. So I, I wanted to have this discussion before we ran out of time with the September 1st calendar, because to me, there's um, there's another population that could be served with uh, doing something at this site that would be rental, uh, two to three units potentially. Next door is the Rising Sun Opportunity Center, and they uh, work through the building trades in providing training to people incarcerated in Santa Rita. And they give people an opportunity to learn um, skills and trades that would en enable them to return from being incarcerated and have an opportunity uh, with work workforce um, development and employment to have upward social and economic trajectory um, for you know helping reduce recidivism. And it seems maybe like, well, what is three units gonna do? Uh, but in working with uh, Rising Sun, they've told me that when they have cohorts of people who come out of the jail in any one of their classes, which can be from 10 to 20 people usually, there are two to three people who are homeless, um, who are coming out of jail and who are um, either living in other people's homes, living in abandoned buildings in West of Oakland, living in their car on 36th Street, 
and they said that that has presented a challenge for them. Um, so to me, it feels like it isn't um, it isn't uh, it isn't about where the property is. It's more to me about what is the right thing to do. And so I feel like that some of the options that were presented under option two are maybe it's two. Um, the option related to providing some simple, maybe modular micro unit style housing um, on the lots uh, that would be stackable, perhaps a, a two or three story place that would accommodate people um, made available through an RFP to a small nonprofit developer who would have a partnership to um, either run or manage the admissions process because perhaps it could be transitional housing so there could be a regulatory agreement for um, folks who are coming through rising sun or through another any other boss there are other um, types of work organizations in in the county that will work with people who are formerly incarcerated to give them um, some time time limited access to that housing while they are seeking employment skills um, or alternatively we don't want to do that it could be something more um, dynamic, like there could be a two or three story building with an ADU where the um, the regulatory condition is that for those units, a person has to be formally incarcerated to be able to live in them. But for the ADU, that is provided as a transit transitory or transitional housing option so that people who are in the program, it could be managed as through some sort of lease back agreement where the city um, the city has that property available to Rising Sun as a partner to lease those places or offer that as free free housing to a person who's in their program for the six to 12 weeks that they'd be in that program. Um, it's not a super big piece of land. And I had one question for Valerie, which was, do we believe that the parcels two and three by themselves are developable, Valerie, or is the concept that you put forward about um, kind of e each of these other missing middle types, would it require the use of parcel one to develop them, do we think as well? Um, I do believe that we would need to use all three parcels. I think when we looked at the development standards, um, each parcel in Oakland could have one unit built on it. Um, and then of course the property in Emeryville could have one or more, but the, I think there's a restriction on the size. So we believe we could possibly get three units out of the total, out of all three sites, but we would need all three sites to do that. Yeah. So. My, my preference then would be to do a duplex on that first two front facing side, a two story duplex modular perhaps, and then put an ADU style place on the third lot in the back that's Emeryville, um, an Emeryville site. But if, if folks, so the threshold question that was presented to us, you know, is does the council more interested in selling the vacant parcels? As Scott noted, it, it would take staff time to do this for a small project. And there's obviously a lot of other things going on in the city. So I wouldn't begrudge council members if they're like, this is a great idea, but maybe not a priority. Um, take, would we like to sell those parcels and put them into an affordable housing fund? Or would we like to move on to the other questions to discuss what we'd be interested in? So I'd like to first just take the pulse of the council, having heard what my motivation and ideas were when I asked for this item, um, what you think about that and whether it'd be better served for us to sell this and recoup the 240 and any money we'd make off this property. I also think that it's worthwhile asking the county with measure A1 monies, um, whether or not the county, this would not be an expensive project probably to build because of the size of it. So I think that asking the county, so since we're not gonna get RENA credit and I don't want RENA credit, I wanna do the right thing myself. Um, but I think that asking the county to um, assist in helping finance a project like this to do something meaningful um, for people who are returning citizens to me would be a worthwhile ask. It's not a promise, obviously, but I think we should ask if we're interested in doing that. And there may be other populations that you all feel are important. Um, I would just know we put family housing in Estrella Vista. We're putting housing for extremely low income seniors. Um, I'm sorry, very low income seniors and uh, foster youth at 4,300 San Pablo and we're putting permanent supportive housing for the homeless at 3,600 San Pablo. So we are you know, really trying to make sure we have space available for a lot of folks. And I do know that um, group home and congregate home spaces for people who are either on parole or on probation, um, that those opportunities are very rare because cities typically do not grant conditional use permits to cite those things. So this would be an opportunity for us to lead and actually provide a space to people who are returning who want to do something different with their future. Others I've spoken, others wish to speak. Member Medina. I have a, a question actually about your kind of proposal here. Um, given that we are citing 
you know, permanent supportive housing units in 3600 San Pablo directly across the street from Rising Sun. Um, honestly, I, I it's just ignorance on my part. It, are those units precluded from housing formerly incarcerated individuals or individuals on parole? Um, it would depend on the it would depend on the um, RCD um, master agreement. We we don't. I'd, I'd have to ask the city manager of Valerie whether we have. I don't know if we have that already in place or not. There's usually um, conditions for um, applicant and resident selection, and they usually do have some level of um, restrictions that they're allowed to use. It it can usually be negotiated at, a, at an administrative level, but I would just ask if we have anything on that to her question. Uh, not at this point. Um, we have not gotten to the marketing and leasing plan or the supportive service plan. I mean, they are um, permanent supportive housing for formerly homeless individuals, which could then, of course, in encapsulate um, incarcerated individuals, but there's nothing specifically targeting them um, that has been identified or discussed at this point. But there's nothing precluding us for asking for asking for that as well on that side, correct? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, thank you. I'll just, I'll just uh, note though, having done state advocacy on this issue that a lot of affordable housing developers um, and their, whether they self-manage or they retain other entities like, um, you know, the ambassador housing has a private management company and they do, I, I call it my words, um, they do cream the crop as to what, who they pick. So they do put um, record barriers in place for who they select. So even though they're selecting low income people or people from a target demographic or population, they will say you can't have a misdemeanor in the last five years. Um, you can't have other things. So that is a barrier that does exist in affordable housing, even if it's been um, developed outside of a public housing or public housing authority context. So that does exist. And um, I know I tried to run a bill to actually eliminate their ability to do that. So um, it, it, is a, it is a real thing. And if we develop the RFP and say that it, it needs to be um, made available to a person who's on probation, for example, um, then somebody who would manage that or take on that responsibility. And there are developers that I am aware of who would develop a place like this um, to provide group group and congregate home setting to people. And it could be as one, one of the options offered, it could be a co-housing type of situation where we do a two-story building that has four bedrooms or five bedrooms in it. And so four or five people live in a co-housing setting instead. We can do that. Okay. Yeah, I, I first think it's a lot. Yeah, thank you for answering the question. So I, my, my concern is this, right? Tiny site, only a few units and could cause a lot of staff time. I mean, it seems like we have to, we don't have another funding source identified, so we have to go out for the county. Um, the max we can put on here is three units. And it seems like this kind of program that you're proposing would actually require a lot of staff time to manage. So those are my concerns about it, despite generally supporting the idea. And also there is the fact that we have another housing site across the street that could be suitable um, and could potentially house individuals from this background as well. So um, not fully against it, but just wanna like talk through those as my top line concerns. Okay, others? Member Martinez. I'm just wondering if we, um, Mayor Bowders, if we were to move in the direction of your um, recommendation, uh, if we were not to um, get back uh, responses to an RFP that would meet our desires, I guess this is a staff question, do we have enough time to, um, to be moving on this and still be in compliance with um, where we need to be on schedule with disposing of or using this land? A great question. I, I have not kind of documented out the timeline that if we did not um, get enough respondents as to how we could move forward. Um, I guess I would hope that there's some recommendation of an alternative option that we would receive from you in case we need to make some type of pivot so that we can keep moving forward. Um, that's probably what I would be seeking today. Well, and another question, Valerie, is how broad can an RFP be? Like, can we, um, for instance, when we were looking at 4,300 um, San Pablo, could we, I think we, we, we did open up the world of possibility of like, intergenerational housing or senior housing mm -hmm. so i'm just wondering how you know we could we could shoot for the moon and ask to see if people can meet the um the needs that we have in this specific neighborhood to support a specific group for a specific program 
And if they can't, what are the other ideas um, for this plot of land that would, you know, meet other desires that we have to, you know, my, again, my desires are to maximize uh, the amount of housing that we can build there because I'm not convinced that if we sell the land that that will happen um, under other circumstances. I definitely think that is an opportunity. I have um, managed RFPs before where there are priority points for meeting specific requirements that the city is looking for. Um, and so those developers that come in with that specific type of targeting towards what we're looking for would be able to receive additional points where it, but somebody could still apply and offer something different so that we could get a wider variety of proposals. That is something that we could do is structure it in that kind of form or fashion to where we provide preference or priority points for those that are targeting formerly incarcerated or whatever special target group or income category that the council would desire. Great, thank you, Valerie. Colleagues, I think that would save time if we moved in this direction. Mr. Bryan. Thank you, Mayor Bowers. I just want to make a, a little footnote here about the uh, Oakland zoning. Uh, we've said that we could get, uh, I think we said two units in on the Oakland parcels. That's based on the fact that there are two separate parcels there. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in the Oakland zoning and we haven't discussed this with the Oakland staff yet. So we would, we would need to explore this further with them. But my quick read of the RM4 zoning regulations in Oakland is that it allows one unit per parcel up to a certain minimum size, which I think is like 4,000 square feet. So if those parcels were merged into a, a single parcel, you'd still only be able to have one unit on them because they're too small and they don't meet the minimum size. You can have two because of the fact that they're two separate parcels now, but the Oakland zoning does not allow a duplex, I don't believe. So I'm just, just putting a pin in this to say that we will need to do further exploration with the Oakland staff. Maybe there's a creative way to interpret their zoning, or maybe we could uh, apply for a rezoning in Oakland. Uh, but I believe there are some constraints on the number of units you can put in the Oakland parcels. Charlie, why did we ever buy these parcels in the first place? It's before my time. I can't tell you. <laughs> I believe my understanding is that, uh, as Valerie said, the redevelopment agency was attempting to assemble a uh, bunch of parcels along Adeline Street for a larger project. And I think this is as far as they got. I believe it got bog bogged down for some reason. I don't know if Valerie has any further background from her reading of the of the record, but. Unfortunately, I do not. That's as far as I got to. Okay. It's like a crappy monopoly play is what it looks like. <laughs> I will say that in my research, there was a point in time when the city was looking to sell the properties to the adjacent property owner, um, but that negotiation fell through. Okay, others with thoughts? <laughs> Don't all jump in once. Okay, so would people rather sell this or try to do something with it? You aren't gonna hurt my feelings if you'd rather sell. How much can we get for it again? Yeah, do we actually, that's a great question. Do we know the market value of this parcel? parcel. I do not. <laughs> Unique location and shape. <laughs> <laughs> does anyone want to weigh in on this? No, nobody wants to weigh in on this. Right, so. Okay, Scott, thank you for being brave and going first. Scott says to sell, Allie. Yeah. I would want to know, honestly, if we came back from staff, I want to know how much staff time it would take to deal with this. And if it's like two or three units, like two units almost seems like it's just like insane if we're doing this this for two units, right? Um, I could be convinced for three units of staff's like, oh, this isn't a very big lift for us, but I don't want to overburden staff for something that's going to be a complete pain because we're dealing with multi-jurisdictions and two units maximum. Okay. Member Martinez. Thank you. You know, it, if if we're dealing with a space that could end up being congregate housing, you know, it's it's we would be housing much more than two people. And again, I'll, I'll say it for a third time. My biggest issue with this parcel is lands owned by our city are hard to come by. We're not going to get an opportunity every day to um, own another piece of Emeryville. We're so small um, and we don't have 
those tools redevelopment to um you know play that monopoly game anymore so i i, I think I really do want to maximize every square foot that we control, um, even if it's in Oakland, um, to build as much housing as we can. Um, how who that who it houses and um, uh, is is not the, my top priority, um, but I am definitely open to um, populations in need and populations. Um, that are coming back from incarceration um, and who are, are receiving retraining in our own city. I think that would be great, but I, I would wanna leave the door open to, um, to other opportunities should that not work out. And I'd wanna be able to work quickly. Um, and perhaps tonight's not the night when staff can give us all of those answers that would satisfy member Medina, for instance, on um, how much staff time different scenarios would take um, so I'm, I'm, it's, I think it's tough to make a decision tonight. Ever watch? Without knowing how much we would actually get, member Martinez makes a solid point about the opportunity to operate on city owned land. And then also the congregate housing, it's not just going to be necessarily just two units housing just two individuals um it could be you know it, it could be several and so it is i do not have a an answer right now i'm still weighing it out right now thinking about it it's it's very tough and i do think there's where as we're talking through it, it sounds like we're coming up with more questions than we are answers. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is challenging, but I, I do appreciate your your plan, Mayor Bowders, as far as uh, centering of uh, very vulnerable populations, um, especially those who are attempting to reestablish themselves via employment and given given that opportunity and knowing how very difficult it is for folks who have been formerly incarcerated who are formerly incarcerated to find safe and stable housing knowing personally um having seen the barriers they experience this is a, a rare opportunity for us to um be it be an answer and be a blessing to those folks so um this is hard, and that is my response at this moment. Hey, Member Medina. All right. Fortunately, this is a study session, so I think I've got a path forward here. I still have a recommendation, so would you like me to go first? Or do you want to go, go ahead? And Let me go first and then see what you say. I think our recommendation is that staff comes back with um, a couple of pieces of information that we need to move forward. One being like, how much can we get for the sucker if we sell it? Because it is weird. And two being, what is uh, what would the RFP look like and how much staff time would it take to get this out the door? Um, and the third piece of information is what's our timeline if we don't get responses for the RFP and can we still sell in compliance with the state requirements? Yeah, so I'll tell you, uh, we're, we're not very far off on, from where each other are. Really so aren't. My, my, uh, my, my preference would be to answer those uh, questions related to the cost, uh, or I'm sorry, to the sale value of the property um the timeline for staff i would also think that in, in terms of to member martinez who i would align most of my comments with um about what to do i would i would just proffer this given the unique challenges with the zoning and having a limit of one um one you know unit so to speak per parcel and some of that that other interesting kind of zone rm4 kind of stuff over in oakland um there's also height differences it would be a 35 story a 35 foot building <laughs> 35 stories, 35 foot building um, at the most. Um, I actually think the more I listen to everybody that the actual best way to actually blend all of these things was is different than my original thought on the structure. It's actually that it should be a single unit. It should be a large congregate style unit that has um, the ability to let multiple people live in it. So to Ali's point, is this gonna be great if we have just two units like, right? Instead of looking at it as units, let's look at it as people. So if it was, um a three-story house a single home 
right? But it had five bedrooms in it and it offered five people an opportunity and it was one spot to manage as opposed to two or three units to manage. So there's one regulatory agreement and it's real simple. There's an applicant, you know, I, I can think of a couple, I won't name them here because I don't want to put them on the spot, but I can think of a couple of folks who work in this space who would come and build, um, build a home that has five or six bedrooms on a, on a lot like this um, and have five or six people you know, live in it and they would actually operate and regulate the place themselves. They would do the admissions because they, they do stuff like this with re-entering people. Um, and I, there's such a demand for it that there was an effort in the state in the last two years to actually um, put money aside to help folks who are working with the re-entry population identify sites to do group homes for four to five people. So there is a demand for this. Um, and so I, I would just like to say that I would agree with coming back with answers to these questions and the timelines. But I also, if, if folks are amenable in terms of streamlining the decision-making process so we don't run out of time, I would like to suggest that, that perhaps the only thing that seems to be feasible here without encumbering all the Oakland process and some of the other issues is maybe we just propose a single unit, but that unit has, you know, co is a co-housing style unit, right? And it's, it's opportunity to put as, you know, and we don't maybe put a cap on what can be done. And we just say, we're looking for a co-housing that provides, um, opportunity to people on reentry who are looking for workforce employment opportunities and it will be managed by a nonprofit provider um, at a low low to no you know income level um, so that they and they can come back and say well here's our five bedroom design or here's our six bedroom design and we can just see what's available and I would say that the alternative to member Martinez's question is I would say that if we don't get a proposal that we like we just sell it and that's what I would do I would I mean it, there's no point to me in, in holding on to it and trying to like have staff jump through tons of hoops multiple times. I would just say we should just, that would be that would be my suggestion now is to cut the timeline and just say, we, let's ask them to come back with the answers to the questions, but like maybe we just also say, can you show us what an RFP would look like to just put this out? If folks are agreeable to that, then we could just put it out. And if there's no no response, then we just sell it. I'm fine with that. I support I that. You support that? So we just ask them, so an RFP that would, so do we need to go through the rest of the questions to fill, fill out that? Answer, Madam City Manager. Would you want additional information, Valerie? Are you comfortable with the, the feedback? I'm comfortable. Okay, okay. So good an RF, to go. An RFP for some sort of co-housing congregate place that would have a regulatory agreement for a nonprofit operator. Okay, and then we'll we'll just simply, if we don't have an answer by the deadline for the RFP that we all like, then we will just simply give staff the ability to sell it. Seems easy enough to me. Okay, Thank you that's so much. It. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Valerie. Sure. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for the patience and attention to that item. Um, so let me see here. So that brings us to adjournment. The time is 714 and this uh, study session meeting is adjourned, Madam Clerk. And I'll give her a moment to make her notes. And the time is still 714 and I'd like to call to order the City of Emeryville as the management of Emeryville Services Authority. I would like to note that uh, the provisions for AB 361 as noted in the prior meetings are still in place and the members are all still present. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve this agenda. I will make a motion to approve this agenda. Is there a second to my motion? Second. Okay, there's a second by member Martinez. Please call the roll. Council member Donahue. Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Council Member Welch? Aye. Vice Mayor Medina? Aye. And Mayor Bowers? Aye. Uh, ex parte communications, are there any communications to report? I see none. Now is the time for public comment for items not on this agenda. Members of the public who wish to comment for an item not on this agenda for this meeting will have one minute to do so. Chair, did you receive any written comments? I did not. Okay, and I see no hands raised. Public comment is now closed. And I will move to the consent or uh, the action items. So the action item is the um, AB 361 continuing resolution. Members, is there discussion? Seeing none, is there public comment? Seeing none, is there a motion? I moved. Second. Motion by Member Martinez, second by Member Donahue to approve this resolution. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Council Member Welch? Aye. Vice Mayor Medina? Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. The resolution is approved. Madam Clerk, the time is 7.15. This meeting is adjourned. The time is 7.15 p.m. I call to order the City of Emeryville as the successor agency to the Emeryville Redevelopment Agency. Please note that this meeting is being conducted pursuant to Assembly Bill 361 as stated in the prior meetings this evening. 
Please note that all members are still present. This time I'll take a motion to approve this agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Vice Mayor Medina, second by Member Welch to approve the agenda. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Council Member Welch? Aye. Vice Mayor Medina? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. Members, are there any ex parte communications? Seeing none, now is the time for public comment. For items not on the agenda, a member of the public who wishes to comment for an item not on tonight's agenda for the redevelopment agency will have one minute to do so. I see no hands. Public comment is now closed. We will move to the consent calendar. Members, is there a motion? No moved. Second. Motion by Member Martinez, second by Member Donahue to approve this calendar uh, consent items. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Council Member Welch? Aye. Vice Mayor Medina? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. Consent calendar being approved. We have one action item, which is the Assembly Bill 361 resolution. Is there any public comment for this resolution? Seeing none, is there any discussion? Seeing none, any motions? So moved. Second. Motion to approve by Member Martinez, seconded by Member Donahue. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Council Member Welch? Aye. Vice Mayor Medina? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. The resolution being approved. The time is 7.17 p.m. Madam Clerk, this meeting is adjourned. And the time is 7.17 p.m. I call to order the City of Emeryville's regular City Council meeting. Today is April 5th, 2022. As announced at prior meetings, this meeting is being conducted pursuant to exemptions to the Brown Act, authorized by Assembly Bill 361. Madam Clerk, please note for the record that all members remain present. At this time, I will entertain a motion to approve this agenda. I move. Second. Motion by Member Martinez and a second by Member Donahue to approve this agenda. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Council Member Welch? Aye. Vice Mayor Medina? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. The agenda being approved. There are no special orders of the day today. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you have announcements on committee and commission vacancies? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I will just announce that our currently open recruitment um, for unexpected vacancies closed yesterday. We did get, a f I think at last count, we had received five applications for the various openings. So um, when we go to a point, when you go to a point at your May 3rd meeting, that will not fill all vacancies. Um, and so we'll just roll any remaining vacancies into our annual recruitment. Uh, the only exception to that was we have our two seats on the ETMA board. That recruitment uh, doesn't close until May 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is council member special announcements or reports on meetings attended. I'll first call on member Welch. Do you have any announcements or special meetings attended? No, Mayor Bams. Okay, Thank member you. Donahue. No. Okay, member Martinez. Not this time. Okay, and Vice Mayor Medina. Don't think so. Okay. Um, the only announcement I would have on meetings attended is that this last Wednesday, the Alameda County Transportation Commission held its first retreat in, I believe, five years. And uh, I was uh, honored to have the opportunity to put that retreat plan together with the amazing staff at the Alameda CTC. And um, we had a full day of really engaging presentations and presenters and speakers. I want to thank Charles Brown um, for coming and speaking on racial equity and transportation planning at our plenary at lunch. It was a very um, excellent topic and it uh, led its way to my agenda for this year for the commission which I just would share briefly with uh, the council members um, that I've created a um, justice equity diversity and inclusion committee and we will be developing a racial equity action plan for the county um, to ensure that all the procurements contracts and things we do across the county at the transportation commission are done with an emphasis on a racial equity lens there's a number of um, affiliated actions we're going to take us that's related to that Second is that we are going to adopt a countywide uh, bike corridors uh, plan, a network and a plan, and that we are going to use that to help uh, apply for federal funding for bike projects across the county. Um, and with that, we are going to be prioritizing in this round of the CIP calls for um, applications. There will be extra points given to applications from cities that prioritize eliminating um, the high injury mm -hmm. network. That would be you, Vice Mayor Medina. Um, the high injury network and um, 
uh, helping ensure that we are delivering uh, safety first in Alameda County. And then lastly, uh, we are going to engage in a discussion on climate action and its nexus with uh, transportation and look to partner regionally with EBCE and the Air District and other agencies. Um, and we're going to be a convener for a forum on alternative fuels and clean energy in transportation and goods movement this fall. Uh, so that would be my report out on meetings attended. City Manager's report, Ms. Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nothing to report this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, item eight members is ex parte communications. Please take a look at the uh, agenda items here and I will call on each of you to announce any ex parte communications, starting with member Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did meet with Rich Robbins and John Gooding on item 12.2. And um, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask Mr. City Attorney to please clarify for the, the public's um, clarification um what uh we need to report out on ex parte communications um, per our rules certainly uh, council member martinez uh, rule 4.6 from the emeryville city council rules of procedures sets forth reporting requirements and provides that an ex parte communication is any substantive oral or written communication between a decision maker and another party to the matter that is relative that is relevant to the merits of an agenda item and which takes place outside of a city council meeting that has been noticed and is open to the public when an ex party contact does occur the council member must disclose the content and the substance of the information communicated on the record at the city council meeting where the item will be taken up the rule, this rule was first added by the city council on January 17, 2017, and has been amended since that time. For the requirement to apply a substantive oral or written communication between a member of the city council and another party to the matter must occur. So if in fact you are considering a matter um, on your agenda and you had a oral or written substantive communication with the applicant or the the party that is um, relevant to the matter that is being considered by the city council then that is an ex party communication that should be um, disclosed as part of the city council meeting and just to clarify i'm sorry go ahead Robert. oh that's, I, I was going to ask for further clarification too thank you mr mayor I, it's just um uh, so if a general member of the public who might have an opinion on a project, for instance, um, emails all of council, is that something we need to report if they are not a party to the matter? No, that is not. That does not fall under the rule of an ex party communication. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and member Martinez, did you have any other items to report other than the one you gave? No. Okay. Member Walsh, do you have any ex parte communications report? I too um, attended a meeting with Mr. Robbins and Mr. Gooding on item action item uh, 12.2 as well. Okay, thank you. Member Donahue, do you have anything to report? Nothing to report. Okay, Member Medina, do you have anything to report? Yep, on item 12.2, I met with Mr. Robbins, Mr. Gooding, Ms. Capio, and Mr. Sears. Okay, and on item 12.2, I met the same people that Member Medina met, those four same individuals. And I also had a meeting with uh, Mark Steffen from the public market on that item. Um, okay, so that concludes our ex parte communications. And that now moves to public comment. Now you, is the time for public comment for items um, on the consent agenda or items not on tonight's agenda at all. Two minutes for public comment for this uh, item. Madam Clerk, do we have any electronic com comments submitted in advance of tonight's meeting? We did not. Oh, I'm sorry. We did not. Okay, thank you. I will recognize first in the queue for live speaking, Brian Donahue for two minutes. Go ahead. Good evening. Good evening. I don't think he's been promoted yet, uh, yeah, Sherry. He, he doesn't have talking permitted yet. There we go. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Okay, so I want to uh, ex uh, excoriate the council and the staff for last meeting's piss poor performance with regard to the fact that you believed 
you, you made it clear that you believe the developer of the the, the Nady site who was caught red-handed working on a Saturday in violation of the noise ordinance, who was then asking for a noise ordinance waiver. When the developer told everybody here that he, he was simply, it was a matter of public safety, of a public safety emergency is what he said. It was a direct quote, public safety emergency. And to the extent that the five of you and the staff believed him, I say, shame on you. Why didn't you do your due diligence? Find out he's lying. You know, developers lie. They have a material interest in lying. As a matter of fact, they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to lie if it's not illegal to lie. And that's what this guy did. This guy lied to you. I alerted you to it. And instead of believing the, the, the person with no material interest, you believe the one with the material interest, as in, like, as if, you know, you wouldn't, of course, the developer wouldn't lie to us. Developers are good people You're here to help Emeryville. This is sort of the Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farms sort of um, culture at City Hall. And that's putting as, as the rosy of a picture as I can. In fact, it's actually probably much darker than that. We know that they, with the, that they lied because when the police showed up at the site to shut down the job site, they didn't say a word about any public safety emergency. They just shut the job site down and walked away. That was came, come up with later by the developer after he was caught and he realized he had to come up with something good to make to take it to make it so you wouldn't see him as a just a you know as a lawbreaker. Time. So why believe him? Why no, believe no. the developer? Thank you. It's your time. Other members of the public who wish to comment for an item out on tonight's agenda or the consent calendar. Seeing none, members, is there any item that you wish to discuss on the consent calendar or pull from the consent calendar? Seeing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? I'll move consent. Second. There's a motion by Vice Mayor Medina and a second by Member Welch to approve the consent calendar's items. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue. Aye. Council Member Martinez. Aye. Council Member Welch. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. All right, the consent calendar be approved. I would just like to um, take a brief moment to, on item 10.5, to just thank the members of the Watergate Parents Group who um, have been moving on the Davenport Mini Park item for a while. And we are happy to uh, move that into a position to be funded and constructed out on the peninsula, hopefully in the very near future. So thank you for your continued attention and advocacy for that item. Okay, uh, there are no public hearings tonight, so we move on to section 12, which is our action items. The first is a request to remove an ADA blue disabled parking zone at 1048 45th Street in Emeryville. And I believe we are gonna have a presentation from Mohammed. Hello, uh, City Council. I'm uh, honored to be here tonight. Uh, hopefully I'll keep this as uh, short as possible. Uh, the city received a request to remove an existing ADA blue disabled parking zone on December 20th. From, a, uh, from applicant Charles, Charles Hubert. The existing disabled parking space had initially been requested by the former owner of the residence at 1048 45th Street, Emeryville, and was approved by the city council. Mr. Hubert has since purchased and moved into the residence and the disabled parking space is no longer needed. As seen on page two of this presentation, uh, there are two other disabled parking spaces on the westerly end of 45th Street, closer to San Pablo Avenue, and another space in front of the senior center on Salem. The request was forwarded and considered on January 12th of the transportation committee meeting. The location of the parking zone was noticed 72 hours in advance of the committee meeting and the committee meeting agenda was posted as required by the Brown Act. There were no members of the public in attendance in favor or opposed to the removal of the parking zone. The transportation committee moved to approve the request to remove the blue disabled zone and voted unanimously to forward the request to city council for consideration and action. The applicant has been notified by email and the parking zone has been noticed 72 hours in advance of this meeting. The transportation committee and staff recommend that the city council approve the uh, removal request for this item and thank you. Mohammed, that was perhaps the single best presentation I've ever received on a parking item. I appreciate the clarity and brevity in which you provided all that information and in the summary of the recommendations. Are there any clarifying questions from members to that extremely well-made presentation? Seeing none, now is the time for public comment. A member of the public who wishes to comment on this item will have two minutes to do so. And uh, Sherry, in a, before I call on the live speaker, have we received any comment cards? We have not. 
Okay, I want to wish Ashby and Adeline a very lovely evening. Go to bed and make sure you have your googer before you go to sleep. And um, with that, I'll recognize Brian Donahue for two minutes. I'm, rem I'm reminded of the last time I attended a meeting where there was a blue curb being discussed. The, the, app, the person that asked for the blue curb asked for it and, and asked you, the council members, to look the other way when it came time to the city's regulations about blue curbs. Uh, and that's what, you rec that's what you did. And the argument offered was that there's not enough blue curbs in the neighborhood by council member Donahue. But you did look the other way. You did not, you chose to not uh, uh, observe the city's own regulations about blue curbs. So when I got up and I am former council member and city and uh, attorney John Fricky got up and, and mentioned the city's own regulations, we got called nasty names by the elected officials. Public comment, you know, offered to ask for the city to not violate its own regulations was responded with nasty name calling. That's not what you would call citizen, an encouraging citizen debate or activism or encouraging certain you know citizens to you know, to petition their government it's the opposite it's a you know it's a barrage of intimidation so i don't think you should be calling people names from your your lofty dais especially when they're when the citizens are just asking you to observe your own regulations so now moving forward to this item here tonight remember it's on you there's not enough blue carb got blues uh, curbs zones in the triangle neighborhood that's what you said last time are you now going to take one away and then what do i do with the insults that i received last time when i told you to not put a blue curb in what you know what are you going to insult me again go ahead okay uh that public comment has ended is there any other person who wishes to make comment on this item Madam Clerk, can we return our speaker to the audience, please? Thank you. Okay, members, is there any discussion or questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Um, I'll move to approve. Second. Okay, there's a motion to approve this resolution by Vice Mayor Medina. It was seconded by Member Welch. Please call the roll. Councilmember Donahue. Aye. Councilmember Martinez. Aye. Council Member Welch. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. The resolution is approved. Thank you, staff, for that uh, updated presentation. And that will move us now to item 12.2, which is the Emory Station Overland Project, located currently at 1582nd, so I'm sorry, 1580 62nd Street in the city of Emeryville. And Charlie, will you be giving this presentation to start? Uh, Senior Planner Miru Desai will be making the staff presentation. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Miru. Uh, good evening, Council uh, Mayor Bowders and Council Members. I'm Miru Desai, uh, Project Manager for this proposal. Uh, Sherry, could you please have the... Uh, thank you. And if you can move on to the next slide. So this is a proposal that has come in front of you a couple of times before, and it's a 3.9-acre site uh, located uh, between 63rd, and 62nd and Hollis and Overland Avenues. There are existing buildings, all of which will be demolished except for the Hollis building, which fronts uh, Hollis Street. Next slide, please. The proposal includes a division uh, of the site into two parcels. One parcel would accommodate the existing Hollis building and uh, the second parcel would accommodate the new, the two new buildings. Next slide, please. So the last time the uh, council saw this uh, uh, saw this proposal, or reviewed the proposal, was on November 16th of last year. Since then, the uh, project has been reviewed by the BPAC committee and also by the planning commission uh, last month. Uh, next slide, please. So the project has remained unchanged substantially since you saw and reviewed it uh, in November. It's a new uh, five-story, 300. Uh, thousand square feet of R&D space and a new uh, parking garage. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the site plan uh, and the way it operates has also not changed. And the changes that have been made uh, since November are the following. Next slide, please. 
Uh, they have now added new planting areas on the R&D building roof. Uh, they have also added planting areas and solar panels uh, on the existing uh, Hollis building roof. They have provided additional details on landscaping plants, including uh, planting uh, planting uh, pallet as well as hardscape materials. More details on the terraces in the uh, R&D building have been provided. They have included material bolts and also included additional renderings of the courtyard and artwork. And they have uh, proposed a offsite pedestrian and bicycle improvement. I'm not going to be going through all these uh, changes since the applicant's presentations includes them, except for the pedestrian bicycle improvements. Next slide, please. Uh, the project does involve tree removal. 18 uh, street trees would be removed. The location you can see in the graphic in front of you. The values of the trees are $146,000. As required by regulations, the applicant will need to pay uh, this amount uh, to the city in addition to replanting the street trees. Next slide, please. Uh, they will be planting uh, 27 new street trees. Uh, on all three frontages, uh, that is the 63rd, Overland, and 62nd. Uh, this plan also shows, I'm indicating where the bicycle parking is located, where you see the B, that is the long-term uh, bicycle parking, and the red circles kind of show you uh, where the short-term uh, bicycle parkings are provided. And they are basically in the courtyard uh, along the mid-block uh, mid path. And they are also showing a few short-term bicycle parking within the parking garage. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this uh, site lies uh, in the general plan land use designation of office technology and major transit hub. Uh, the base zone is office technology and the overlay zone is transit hub, where research and development is uh, allowed by right. Next slide. Uh, the FAR that is being proposed is 2.6, and uh, so the project will require bonus points for FAR category. Next slide, please. Uh, but it is the height where uh, both the buildings are going to need a bonus height, and it is the parking garage, uh, which is in the lower height category, which will require 100 bonus points. And the R&D building, uh, which is in a higher height category, will require 60 bonus points. So in, in, to, in total, the project will require the full 100 points, uh, bonus points for height. Next slide, please. So as we know, uh, the way to obtain bonus points, half of them are through provision of affordable housing, and the other half is through the provision of community benefits. As this is a non-residential project, it will need to pay 100% of the additional affordable housing impact fee at the time of building permit issuance. So what this means that if a building permit were to be issued in this fiscal year, uh, then it would trigger a payment of $2.9 million. Obviously the actual fee will be whatever the affordable housing impact fee is at the time of building permit issuance. Next slide, please. Uh, the remaining 50 bonus points will come from community benefits and uh, the applicant is proposing two ways of uh, going about it. One is by provision of additional uh, public open space and then providing converting uh, 10 of the existing 41 labor units in the Hollis Street building uh, to below market uh, units. Next slide, please. So uh, the applicant is proposing uh, additional bonus points uh, by providing additional open uh, public open space. And what they are including is the mid uh, block passage that is shown in dark green and a portion of the courtyard. And in terms of how, it, in terms of the areas, it, it, it comes to the amount that is required by regulations. Next slide, please. Uh, the remaining 30 points will be obtained, as I mentioned, uh, through a provision of a conversion of the live work units into BMR units. Uh, the council looked at this proposal at the last study session, uh, where you were presented with negotiated terms for providing the 10 below market live work units, and three will be for the very low income households, and the seven will be for low income households. These are calculated to have a value of approximately $4.92 million, which is 3% of the construction valuation. So there's 10 bonus points per 1% construction valuation, and that's how uh, they reach 30 points. Uh, at the November study session, uh, you indicated that you were satisfied that the project could obtain 30 bonus points in this manner. Next slide, please. 
parking. Uh, so the parking that is triggered by this proposal, of course, we don't have any minimum requirements. So it is zero to 411 spaces. Uh, the proposed uh, parking is 496 spaces of which 68 spaces will be for existing users in the Hollis building. Next slide, please. So our regulations does allow uh, an applicant to apply for a use permit to allow more parking than the 10% above the estimated demand, provided the two findings are made. Uh, one, that uh, the applicant has demonstrated that the parking is indeed required for the anticipated demand for the use and that the provision of parking over maximum will not result in an overdependence on uh, cars and will not adversely uh, impact transit, bike, or pedestrian access to the site or adjacent users. To support this, the applicant uh, has submitted a parking analysis, which is currently being peer reviewed uh, by fair and peers. Next slide, please. So in terms of the bicycle parking, uh, they are required to have 58 long-term and 58 short-term. Uh, they do provide the 58 long-term and they also provide 58 short-term, but 20 of the 58 short-term bicycle parking spaces are shown to be inside the parking garage, which do not meet the locational criteria as short-term parking uh, is, needs to be provided within a convenient distance of and more importantly, clearly visible from the main entrance of the building. So the applicant will need to uh, figure out a way to provide uh, the 20 parking spaces outside uh, and in compliance with this regulation. Next slide, please. Uh, the loading uh, requirement is two medium loading spaces and one large. Uh, they are proposing three large loading spaces. So as designed, the project meets the loading requirements. Next slide. The project also meets our regulations for open space requirements by providing uh, open space in the plaza area. So it's the light green color that we are looking at. So uh, the proposal is to provide open space in form of uh, the courtyard uh, along West Overland, a little bit along the North Lobby, and of course the Art Walk. Next slide, please. Uh, the applicant response to the council comments from the November uh, study session. Uh, at that study session, the council indicated that in order to make the findings required for parking over the maximum, the applicant would need to provide enhancements to pedestrian and bicycle circulation, specifically by providing bicycle lanes around the site and closing Overland Avenue between 63rd and 64th streets to motor vehicle traffic while accommodating emergency vehicles. Staff met with the applicant in December and again in January uh, to discuss these concepts. Uh, the applicant submitted then a plan to install uh, vertical cement curbs to replace the pavement markers and bollards along both sides of Horton Street between Powell and 62nd, both sides of Overland Avenue between 62nd, 63rd, and the north side of 62nd Street between Horton and Hollis. Next slide, please. So this is what basically it looks like, uh, was shown in yellow uh, where the vertical curbs will go. And they also included uh, certain benches for viewing and um, um, seating. Next slide, please. The project was reviewed by BPAC uh, on March 7th. Uh, the committee expressed concern uh, regarding the need for bicyclists to dismount when they reach the southern end of the mid block path, as it does not align with Horton Street. The committee liked the idea of artwork, but commented that it was narrow and that it should be well lit. The committee also expressed concern that the design of the garage precluded future conversion to different land users should the need for parking decline over the lifespan of the garage building. Next slide, please. So subsequently, uh, the applicant uh, submitted a revised proposal for the bicycle pedestrian improvement. And uh, this includes uh, the, uh, the, the Portland cement vertical barriers for bicycle lanes on both sides of Portland from Powell to 62nd. It includes now a creation of a three-way stop at the intersection of Portland and 62nd, along with a crosswalk across 62nd, uh, creation of a two-way barrier protected bicycle lane on the north side of 62nd from Hollis to Overland. And this two-way bicycle lane would extend to Overland northbound and extend up to 63rd Street. 
Uh, they are also proposing closing of uh, overland between uh, 63rd and 64th to become a public linear park. Uh, there are more details provided for this linear park, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to let the applicant present uh, those details. Uh, this was submitted on March 21st and is being reviewed uh, by Fair and Peers. Next slide, please. So the project was reviewed by the commission last week on March 24th. Uh, the commission was generally in support of the project and like the project with concerns expressed on the amount of parking provided and the width of the artwork. Uh, there was a concern expressed for closing overland between 63rd and 64th street with one commissioner commenting that the linear park space may not be utilized a concern was also expressed regarding uh, the vertical uh, curbs along bike lanes and the ability to keep them free of debris uh, the commission was satisfied with the project obtaining a bonus points by providing additional public open space and conversion of uh, 10 live work units uh, to affordable units Next slide, please. So before I uh, go through the questions uh, that are in front of you, I would just like to mention uh, that the, uh, the, the revised proposal for uh, uh, bike and pedestrian improvements were reviewed by the VBAC committee yesterday. Uh, the VBAC generally appreciated the proposal and its minor suggestions uh, to improve uh, the proposal and which included uh, a suggestion of including a DG pathway within the linear park, uh, giving a closer look at the transition of the cycle track as it meets Hollis and uh, ADA compliance within the linear park. So the questions that are in front of you is regarding the bonus points. Does the council consider the designating a portion of 62nd Street Plaza area and the mid-block path as public open space as being appropriate way of obtaining uh, bonus points? And if the council have any other preferences as to how the bonus points may be obtained, uh, is the council does the council believe the applicant has responded adequately to your suggestions for improving bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure? And of course, does the council have any other comments on the overall uh, project design? A couple of hours ago, uh, we received a letter, and I believe it was also addressed to the council members uh, from Holland and Knight on behalf of CCRP and Oxford uh, Properties. Uh, this is a six-page letter. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read, uh, read through it, so I cannot report on it. So that concludes my presentation, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to respond. Sorry, there, there is a, uh, uh, an applicant presentation still, correct, Maru? That is correct. Okay, members, are you okay waiting to have that application, that presentation in the event that questions may be answered in that? Okay, let's have uh, the applicant make their presentation. And I would ask that you do not repeat things that have been presented by staff so that we can move to the discussion and have more time for that. Fair enough. Uh, would you please uh, put up the slideshow? Yes, one moment, please. Thank you. It's just taking a moment. Is everyone seeing that now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sorry Thank for you. the delay. Uh, good evening, uh, council members and mayor. We appreciate this opportunity to review and discuss the 1550, 1550 Emory Station project. My name is Claudia Capio and I'm with Urban Planning Partners and I am assisting Wareham in this effort. Uh, this evening we will provide an overview of the project and I will be brief because of, of those issues that have been presented already by Maru. But we'd like to review the changes that have been incorporated uh, since you last review it. 
Uh, we believe that this project will add a significant new building to the biotech sector in Emeryville while providing significant community benefits. Next slide, please. The presenters tonight would be Rich Robbins and Jeff Sears of Wareham, myself and Matthew Malone of Perkins and Will. Next slide, please. This is the project chronology. We've been, uh, the uh, Maru did a great job in reviewing this, so I'll skip that. Next slide, please. We believe that we share a significant project objectives with the city, uh, particularly the legacy building that we're gonna be retaining, thereby preserving a significant creative community in Emeryville and uh, the significant public benefits in terms of infrastructure improvements to bike and pedestrian facilities and the affordable housing. Next slide, please. Similarly, uh, we think the project will strengthen link linkages between historic and future Emeryville and the existing live work community and new building uh, on, on the campus on the Emeryville, excuse me, Emory Station Life Science Center campus. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is a locational uh, map that shows the Emory Station campus with the Horton spine running through up to 62nd. Uh, the new building will provide a continuation of the campus uh, along with public improvements and access points. And this slide also shows the other Emory Station campus buildings, including Emory Station West, Emory Station North, the terraces, uh, the Amtrak station. Uh, so you can see that this is yet one other development uh, that forms a continuity uh, within this area of Emeryville. M Ms. Capio, is it possible that you could, whatever you're rubbing your microphone against, you could stop doing that? Oh, sorry, yes, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, next slide, please. This slide shows uh, an aerial view of the project site. The pink area will be demolished and the blue area, the Hollis Street building will be retained. A key principle for Wareham is to think holistically about this super block through the connection between old and new Emeryville. And Rich Robbins will give a brief overview of the significance of the Hollis Street building. Good evening. To be brief, we've owned this property since 1978. We've worked on the planning for this upgrade for the last two and a half years. The idea really is to take stock of the existing live work loft space for artists and techies and keep these large spaces in the housing inventory. Uh, as you know, some of our proposal has deed restrictions on some of these units, but the idea behind it is to preserve the Art Deco building itself while building a modern laboratory building as well. We think that future vision would work as a great hybridization, expanding the campus, retaining housing, and being an added amenity to the Emory Station campus. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is a, an overview of the project itself. And I think the salient point here is that Wareham has been respectful of both scale and context. The site could have accommodated up to a hundred foot building and a higher FAR but maxing out the envelope was not as important as a good fit for the campus and the surrounding area. Next slide, please. This is a review, a view of existing 62nd Street. Next slide, please. And then how it would look from Horton viewing up towards 62nd Street with the new building. Next slide, please. Uh, during the past year, we have listened to feedback and comments and we have been able to respond to them including the mid-block passage, the parking demand study, the provision of affordable housing, and the revised open space to meet the bon bonus points and conform to city standards. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is just a, a graphic showing those changes, the green roof and solar panels on the existing building and the new building, as well as the mid-block passage running through the 63rd and enhanced landscaping along Overland. Next slide, please. We also have deepened and 
and uh, redesign the balconies. Uh, this will provide uh, an outdoor indoor connection and uh, we make sure that uh, it is also consistent with the other buildings which where the balconies have been a very important design feature. Next slide, please. Uh, the parking for this project has been a major issue and we have been able to complete a parking demand study that demonstrated that the parking that we have proposed is reasonable. And from the council's comments, we've been able to incorporate major offsite and pedestrian public improvements, strengthening the city network and complementing campus-wide bicycle facilities, such as bike storage, bike pods, repair stations, and bike racks for cargo bikes. Wareham has also indicated following through on a suggestion by BPAC of including chargers for, chargers for electric bicycles. Next slide, please. A big issue related to the parking is the transit hub overlay. That's shown in lavender on this map and the project site is in yellow. We, <coughs> uh, projects within this circle need their parking reduced by 50%. And we would have enough parking if we were one block north so it's been a dilemma for us to look at parking and manage it, manage it well by being able to use alternative means of, <coughs> excuse me, of getting to work and providing offsite public and pedestrian improvements. Next slide, please. To offer some context about parking ratios, 1550 has 1.5 to 1,000, and there are a number of other similar developments, both in Emeryville and around the Bay Area that are shown with higher parking ratios. We note that even progressive cities like Berkeley and San Francisco have permitted higher parking ratios. Next slide, please. Jeff Sears will now speak to Emeryville's leadership in transit-oriented policies. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council people. Just quickly, we've heard from you and from others question that I'd like to speak to, which is the city has worked so hard to encourage and enhance transit and reduce car trips. Why do you need more parking? And I want to answer in this way. Um, Wareham for decades has been a supporter actively in trying to create other ways to travel than single occupant cars. We've been all in with both feet along with you in this. We built in partnership with you the Amtrak station that brought commuter rail to Emeryville. We were one of the founders with you of the Emery Go Round almost 20 years ago. I personally have been on the board for nearly 20 years and have been president of the board for more than half of that period. Without being required to by conditions of approval, our campus has bike share pod, car share. We've got several public bike repair storage area, uh, repair areas. We've tried to take advantage of our campus and create opportunities for bike pedestrian improvements that will encourage the least amount of cars to come. But that amount of cars is not zero. Um, we think our new project does a great, and makes a great step to add to those. A little bit, a bit of history would be helpful. When Emeryville, 20 years ago when we were developing in Emeryville, it was short of parking and you made people build minimum amounts. Office space need three per thousand. Retail space needed five per thousand. You were making people build a lot of parking to catch up so workers were not parking on city streets. Um, <clears throat> then when things were getting a little better, you instituted this transit hub circle, which allowed those big minimum parking levels to be reduced if a, if a developer wanted to. We were actually someone who took advantage of that opportunity and built less than the minimum you required for several of our buildings. And the fact is when our campus started, we were building three per thousand. As we've built smaller garages each time, we've averaged the parking ratio down on the whole campus 
over time incrementally to where it's 2.2 per thousand. That's a, almost a 30% reduction from what it was. So we think that's success. We're ready to take success, success steps into the future. But when you then went further and removed parking minimums, I think this transit hub overlay zone was left as an anachronism and now has unintended consequences that Claudia pointed out that we could be one block away and the amount of parking we're asking for is far less than what's allowed, but right now it's more. So with this proposal, we're proposing to build a garage that has a ratio of 1.5 per thousand. That's the lowest you will have seen in Emeryville. And to make that work, we're gonna have to reduce our parking demand by another 32%. We're at 2.2 per thousand ratio for the campus. 1.5 is over 30% less. Why are we believing we can do that? Because we're gonna do more things to improve and encourage people to take other means of getting to and from work. So we're buying in here with our proposal and we're very proud of it. And um, we'll give you a little bit more uh, details about that now. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jeff. This is just a quick overview of the parking demand study findings. Basically measured three ways. We believe that demand of 205 to 235 spaces more than currently proposed would exist. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the offsite improvements, as Maru explained, I'm, I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but just protected bike lanes from Powell to Horton, and then along, again, a two-way along 62nd up to 63rd on Overland. And then uh, a little bit more description of the, of the improvements contemplated for uh, Overland from 63rd to 64th. And Matt Malone will explain this. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Um, again, I'm Matt Malone. I'm a landscape architect with Perkins and Will. Um, here you can see our concept design for the Overland Avenue Linear Park, which proposes to close Overland Avenue to through traffic between 63rd and 64th Street, just north of our project site. The design is inspired by the tactical urbanism and slow street movements that has swept the nation over the past decade. And more recently, as we've seen with the pandemic, where streets and spaces that were primarily used for vehicular traffic are transformed into vibrant community nodes and safe places for people to gather and recreate. The space will be designed to allow for continued use for emergency vehicle traffic, which we have provided, by, provided for by maintaining a generous 20-foot throughway that we are proposing as an art-filled bike and pedestrian path, taking cues from events such as the San Rafael Annual Chalk Art, art Festival and street murals nationwide that celebrate local communities and artists or even social movements such as Black Lives Matter. This is a place where the community can engage and inform the design and artistic expression of the space and really make it their own. In addition to the community art focus, we, want, we aim to create a comfortable place for people to hang out. We're proposing a number of large shade trees on both, start, on both sides of the street and an enhanced planting buffer to help soften the space. You'll also notice the activity zone along the east side of the street, just at the top of the page here, which we imagine as a playful collection of parklet inspired seating areas with integrated planters, benches, bike parking, and trellises. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go over this since it's already, uh, Maru's already done a great job, but uh, 10 units, seven low income, three very low income, 55 year time frame on the regulatory agreement. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Matt will now give a brief overview of the landscaping proposed for the project. All right, great. Thanks, Claudia. I'll try to be quick here. Just for reference, this is where we were when we first presented to the council. Um, next slide, please. Um, this next slide, what you've already seen, highlights all of the changes that we've made in response to feedback, um, the mid-block crossing, enhanced sustainability measures, and green roofs, solar arrays, as well as the enhanced streetscape along Overland. Uh, next slide, please. If you turn off those red boxes, you can see here more clearly the very robust landscape approach for the project. Um, the, the project is really anchored by our central courtyard space, which is designed as an inviting social hub for the, for the community with outdoor lounge and hangout spaces, collaboration zones, public art, and a beautiful and resilient landscape design. 
the mid block crossing and art walk, which allows pedestrians and cyclists to navigate between 62nd and 63rd street is designed as a path of discovery and an intimately scaled pedestrian connection, similar to those that are found throughout the Emeryville neighborhood fabric. This unique and exciting space is designed as an outdoor art gallery with numerous opportunities for local artists in the form of murals and sculpture, as well as design elements such as custom furnishings and hardscape materials that seek to celebrate the site's industrial past, as well as the numerous makers, fabricators, and artists that call Emeryville home. I do want to acknowledge that the staff report um, mentioned the 20 bike parking spaces currently located in the garage will need to be relocated. And I just want to mention that we plan to relocate this within the mid-block alley and courtyard space. Um, and last but not least, our streetscapes. We propose streetscape improvements um, uh, surrounding our project on 62nd and Overland, as well as brand new curb and streetscape on 63rd, where there's currently no sidewalk or um, streetscape at all. All of these are designed to meet or exceed minimum requirements with throughways, landscape zones, and wanted to highlight that while we're removing 18 existing street trees, we're adding back a total of 27 new trees on all three frontages. Next slide, please. In this visualization, you can see the central courtyard space with the dynamic faceted facade around it, which serves to anchor the terminus of the Harden Street spine. As I mentioned, we really want this place to be the central gathering place for the neighborhood, providing a destination uh, for the community and building tenants with opportunities to sit, rest, socialize, or work outside in this beautiful and shaded landscape courtyard setting. Note the colorful lounge seating, which we hope invites people into the space. And uh, I also want to note that although only portions of this area are required to be publicly accessible, we intend for the entire courtyard and really all of our ground level landscape spaces to be open and inviting to the public. Next slide here. Um, here's the Mid Block Crossing. This image was taken from 62nd Street, looking towards 63rd, that you can see at the very end there. We've designed this to be a very inviting space with murals and art here at the entryway and beyond to invite people in, as well as the ground level landscape trees, seating, bike parking, and artful overhead lighting. Next slide. This is actually supposed to be a video. I don't know if this is going to play, but if not, we can skip it. <laughs> Great, and here is the uh, art walk. We're standing uh, with our back towards the existing building, looking back um, towards the new building beyond. Um, the existing uh, residential building to remain is on the left-hand side and the new garage on the right. Just note the rail spur walkway, custom furnishings which celebrate the site's industrial past as well as the gallery wall. It's punctuated the, with its punctuated facade that could host rotating or permanent exhibits and provide a uni unique amenity and attraction for the surrounding community. Next slide. Uh, we just wanted to close with, we believe that we have significant community benefits and uh, will contribute to Emeryville's biotech cluster and we welcome uh, the council's comments. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, members, before we have discussion and provide feedback, are there clarifying questions about what you've seen, just to clarify anything you've seen that you'd like to understand better before we hear from the public and then we discuss the, um, the proposals and give feedback? Okay, now is the time for public comment. Members of the public who wish to comment on this item will get uh, three minutes for this item to do so. It's a substantial item. Um, did we receive, Madam Clerk, did we receive any written comments for this item? We did not. Okay, the first person I'll recognize is Emily Lieben. You have three minutes, welcome. Good evening, council members. My name is Emily Lieben. I'm an attorney with Holland and Knight. We represent city center realty partners and Oxford properties regarding their ongoing efforts to provide vibrant, accessible development in the city of Emeryville. Throughout the approval process for our projects, we've heard from the city how vital it is for new developments to reflect the unique character of Emeryville's neighborhood, to offer thoughtful and accessible outdoor amenities, and to work hard to achieve the city's goals for a bicycle and pedestrian-focused transportation network. We've therefore been troubled by the expedited review process for the Emory Station Overland project, which seems to shortchange the public and stakeholders the opportunity to provide meaningful input. Given the short time available tonight, I will only address a few of the key areas to this council. First, the overall design for this project is not consistent with the city's vision. The reflective monolithic form does not speak to the Emeryville's unique industrial character or co correspond with the adjacent buildings. 
It also fails to meet many of Emeryville's design guidelines, leading to an inhospitable design that literally overshadows the residential building to the east. Second, the required open space is insufficient and inconsistent with Emeryville's open space and public open space standards. The public open space is visually separated from the street with corporate facilities largely dedicated to the tenants rather than an area for public enjoyment. And the usability of the courtyard overall is questionable given the glare from the reflective building itself. The remaining required open space consists either of the narrow landscaping strips or a narrow dark art walk that the applicant team itself describes as an alleyway, none of which meets the city's open space objectives. For many of these same reasons, the open space provided for bonus points is also inadequate, but even more troubling is the inclusion of the mid-block break. While the common open space is required to have trees, benches, landscaping, art, and other improvements, at least half of the mid-block path features none of these, because it's intended to be used by fire and emergency services. This is precisely why the city prohibits developers from including service areas in the open space calculations. The space is not usable by or enjoyable to the public. Moreover, it hasn't been demonstrated that the affordable housing benefit is a real value given that these units are already in existence and are already quite affordable. Finally, where is required to convincingly demonstrate that excess parking is needed and that the excess parking won't lead to an overdependence on cars? On the first point, where is not demonstrated that additional parking is necessary and certainly not to the tune of 33% more than the city's maximum, particularly where the rest of the campus is already over parked as noted by planning commissioner. On the second, the improvements where I must propose have not reduced the auto dependence of this project. The vehicular circulation around the project site is fully preserved, while at the same time, Wareham has not provided the protective ring around the parcel requested by this council. In light of these serious concerns, we ask the council to give careful consideration to the type of the development that the city envisions. We look forward to working with the city and the applicant team to ensure the city's objectives are achieved. Thank you, Ms. Lieben. The next speaker, please, will be Brian Donahue. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to say, hear, hear, and join the previous speaker. Uh, it was really great to hear developers uh, speak in favor of the, the residents' concerns. Interesting that the developer speaking is not the developer doing the presenting, naturally. But it's nice to hear a developer acknowledge that the residents' concerns should be at least considered. Okay, so <clears throat> I, we should not be. Let me get into my my points, but specific, specifically, we should not be rewarding Wareham and Rich Robbins with a uh, another project where that's going to be a disaster for bicycling in Emeryville. Look at his previous projects in the area. He, he did not provide enough uh, parking for commercial vehicles and the bike lanes are constantly being parked on by his uh, delivery, uh, you know, vendors delivery vehicles, constant. Uh, in the last two years, I've only been, I've only seen it three times where they were not, or weren't, weren't being blocked. Three times in two years. And I, I go, I drive, I go past that site most days. Um, so, Mr. Robbins and Wareham has no credibility on this. They, they, they didn't want to spend the money to provide vendor parking last time, and so they just palmed it off. They just figured, well, we'll just park on the streets, the developer, and block bike lanes. I think that's what's going to be happening with this project. That's this developer's mo. So he should not be trusted. Additionally, Wareham open space is not public open space. Look at what he has built. Look at how it's being used. It's not being used by the public, all that notwithstanding all this over the top, overwrought verbiage from Jeff Sears and company. This is famous for not, or infamous, I should say, for not being public open space. It's like occasionally see like workers eating their lunches there, but that's it. Um, uh, and then the, regarding the parking, letting giving this guy, giving Rich Robbins another favor of parking um, at 33 percent over maximum. If you guys do this, I'm going to go public with this. Another, we're back to the battle days of Nora Davis giving Rich Robbins, you know, pu public largesse favors, which to which he's rewarding her now with naming the train station after her. Apro that's pretty apropos. And then the last thing I wanted to say is my letter was not included in the staff packet. I wrote a letter 
to the, the staff about this project for inclusion on this. It was about this agenda item. Again, my letter is not included in the staff packet, not mentioned in the staff presentation. What does it take? I'm starting to realize it's, it, it's the fact that the letters Hi. are from me specifically is why they're not being included in the staff packets or the staff presentations. So that's unacceptable. That's it's illegal, immoral, and unethical. You can't. You have to treat people equally. No, uh, I don't that care if it's, you don't like me. Thank you. Your time is up. Okay. Is there any other member of the public who wishes to comment? Um, dare I dare I risk the ire of members of the public? I would like to just briefly say that, as was outlined in a question asked by Member Martinez and answered by our city attorney. Um, statements that are received on a project that are not ex parte communications, um, meaning that it wasn't from the applicant or a party to the project or the contract, um, do not make themselves into the packet necessarily as um, a staff presentation item. They're, those things are generally shared with the council members by staff when they're received, if we receive them, um, but they're not an ex parte communication that we would disclose. Um, would any member on staff like to clarify that for any reason further so I don't get myself in trouble with that? I'll take the blame for that. Uh, Mayor, there is a provision with regard to written comments um, mm -hmm. that are submitted that if the requester requests that they be provided to the council as part of the written comments. And apologies, I'm not familiar with what the public commenter was referring to with regard to a letter, but I see Mr. Bryant has his hand up. Sure, if there's somebody, Mr. Bryant, would you like to explain or answer? Yes, um, I just conferred with Ms. Desai and neither she nor I uh, have seen a letter from Mr. Donahue about this project, so we are unaware of that. Okay, so I haven't either, so I just wanna tamp down the whole issue here that if we didn't receive a letter um, that requested that it be sent to council, uh, that would be why we didn't get it. And if we had received a letter, staff would present that to us as they do. So I would just ask Mr. Donahue, um, since you've raised this issue several times with us, if this was sent to staff, um, you know, you can and should copy the city council and you're welcome to do that so that we have that information at the same time. Um, not trying to cut off your avenues to any other member of the city staff or its departments, but I'm just looking to ensure that members of the council receive the information you wish us to receive. Um, so that's my suggestion to you. Um, so now we can move hopefully to the discussion of the item itself. And staff, are there specific questions that you would like us to, as prompts to discuss, or are you simply seeking um, feedback to the items in the study session? I know Maru had like three questions on a slide earlier, but I just wasn't sure if those are the questions you want answered. Yes, uh, if I may, uh, one of the questions was regarding the bonus points, whether you were satisfied uh, with the applicant uh, getting bonus points for additional uh, public open space. Were you satisfied with the applicant's uh, proposal for the pedestrian and bicycle improvements? And then if you had any uh, general comments on the design or uh, the merits of the project. Okay, so let's start with the um, open, I'm sorry, the bonus points. The bonus points, there are 30 points proposed for the housing, which is being offered uh, 41 units of housing. 10 of those units are to be made available to um, low and three of them to very low income households. And I do believe we had a discussion about this several months ago where we provided some regulatory framework in terms and conditions associated with that housing and how that would be captured in a 55 year regulatory agreement and covenant. Members, are those 30 points acceptable to everybody for the um, as 30 points for housing? Yes, I see member Donahue with a thumbs up. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so those 30 points. So the other 20 points that are being proposed are the open space. Um, there were comments about open space. Do folks have questions or comments about the other 20 points on open space? Member Martinez. You're on mute, Member Martinez. My apologies. That has to happen once a meeting, right? Yep. Yep. Um, I do have a question for staff. Um, so we are only considering the courtyard and the mid-block passage as additional public space, right? It's not, the art walk is not um, part of the open space that we're considering, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, the, the art walk is part of the required open space that any project would need to uh, provide. Right, but for the bonus points. Bonus points, it's only the mid-block path and a portion of the courtyard. Okay. 
I am, I am fine with this one. I do have a question about this. Is it common, Maru, for, uh, for a, a, a mid-block path like this that is essentially, it was, was noted, a fire lane? Is it common for that to be treated as uh, open space if it's just a, a paver space and doesn't have a full landscaping plan? Well, initially, this mid-block path uh, was being treated with other you know, amenities, like the, the southern half of it. And then there was this issue of uh, the fire lane, and it is exactly 20 feet. Uh, the mid block path is exactly 20 feet, and that is what is triggering uh, no treatment, landscape treatments. They could uh, modify uh, the footprints of the buildings to widen that path by, say, two feet, and that would make it, uh, you know, a more viable public space. Mayor Bowders, if I may, may also yeah. comment. I would just note that. Uh, there are uh, situations where um, there are, I don't know if you would classify them as officially as open spaces, but that are available for emergency vehicle access. I'm thinking in particular of the Embryville Greenway at Powell and Hollis Street, where the section of the Greenway uh, northeast of that intersection serves as also as emergency vehicle access for the adjacent Elevation 22 project. So when that project was approved, it had to have a fire lane to get out of it at the west end, and the greenway was designated as that fire lane. So that is, I would consider that an open space, and it is being used also as an emergency vehicle access. Sure, it's a landscape space. So let me ask you the question differently. Would staff consider this mid-block passage to count towards the required open space that the developer has or would you count that as uh, a necessary safety feature if it wasn't being used for bonus points would you have counted this mid-block passage as meeting the requirements for the re required baseline amount of open space that's a hard question i think we probably would um, they have sufficient open space elsewhere so that they don't need to count this. Right. I'm just asking, uh, a, I'm asking a hypothetical, I, I guess. I probably. understand. Yeah. It's um, just because I'm, I'm just wondering like if, if fire lanes between buildings are going to count as open space, are we going to ever get open space? If there wasn't an effort to get a bonus point here, would, would future building developers listening to this then just put paved spaces between buildings and call it open space without for just the baseline open space? I would I would say that if the entire length of this uh, mid block passage were a fire lane and nothing else, that uh, I would say it would not count towards open space. In this case, it's only the northern portion of it. I think about the northern half of it that is required to be accessible to emergency vehicles. So um, the other half of it definitely would count as open space. Um, it's debatable whether this half would. I would also note that in the Sherwin Williams project, the uh, portion of the greenway there is uh, designated as emergency vehicle access also. Yeah, I would just note again that it's a landscape space. So I feel differently a little bit about calling something open. Do we have a definition of open space in our code and what it says it is? We do. Um, I mean, we can reference it if you would like. It's got, there are design features that are required in open space. Um, I can pull that up. Thank you. Uh, while you continue your discussion. Okay, while well, he's looking at that, um, other members, Member Donahue? Uh, is the art walk going to be open to the public all the time? And is the connection via bicycle from Horton Street going north through the center space going to be allowed as a continuous ramp? So it will be a ramp on and then our ramp off on to 63rd in other words uh, it'll be relatively efficient for a bicyclist to take that route or are, is a bicyclist going to have to turn one way or another at either end so regarding the art walk uh, it will be open to the public but not 24 7. Uh, the applicant is proposing gates uh, on on the 63rd side of it uh, so it's not open 24-7, but it is open during business hours. 
if that answers the question for you. Uh, regarding the second question, I'm not quite clear what exactly your question was. Uh, if you could re uh, reframe that. If, if you're cycling, is there a, uh, say you're headed north from the protected bike lane on Horton, can you continue riding into this space or do you, ha do you have to go out of your way in a significant amount of distance to uh, continue riding or do you, do you have to get off your bike and get over a curb? So if you're, if you're going northbound on Horton, then you would need to dismount. However, if you're coming using the mid, the proposed uh, mid block path uh, and traveling from 63rd to 62nd, then given the proposal of the protected bike lane that they are uh, proposing along 62nd, they would not need to dismount. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Charlie, just raise your hand when you're ready to come back with an answer on the open space question. Other members who wish to comment on the request for 20 points for this? Charlie, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Fowders. Um, just have to pull it up here. Um, let's see. So in the section of the planning regulations about open space, there is a subsection called open space standards. And then uh, there is a section in, of that called common open space. And this refers to the common open space of both residential and non-residential projects. So if this mid-block path were to be counted as common open space, it would have to um, comply with these standards. And it's a definition, common open space are courtyards, sport courts, play areas, and gardens for communal use within a development um and then it says uh required open space let's see um must shall be provided with a common open space consists of at least 25 percent of the required oh i'm sorry a planted area a planted area shall be provided that consists of at least 25 percent of the required common open space uh all required common open space shall include one seat or 30 inches of bench or seat wall for every 100 square feet of required open space. All common open space shall pr provide one tree per 1,000 square feet of the required open space. Now, I think in, in the case of this project, they are proposing, if the mid-block passage were part of the common open space, it wouldn't be enough to meet their total common open space requirements. So they would have to include some other areas as well, probably in the courtyard. And these requirements of 25% uh, should, should be planted. Uh, that could certainly be accomplished in the southern portion of the mid-block passage and also within the courtyard area. Uh, same with the trees and the benches. Those could be provided within other portions of the common open space. So uh, just as a, at a quick read here, I'm not seeing anything that would preclude the northern half of the passageway as an emergency vehicle access easement from not being included in the common open space. Okay. Others who wish to give comments on this feedback? Do people wanna give 20 points of bonus points for for that proposal as it's been proposed, or do you wish to give feedback on that? I would note that the 20 points also includes some of the central courtyard as well. Correct, yes. Yeah. Remember Martinez? I, I'm gonna go ahead and say yes to this because I think that there are other improvements that the developer has made that they didn't have to make at the request of council. And specifically, I'd, I, I'd love to hear from um, the mayor and the vice mayor on whether they think they um, their requests were adequately addressed in question number two. Maybe if you wish to come back to sure, the one, um, so we have that context, um, I, that, that might be helpful for folks. I'm prepared to 
go ahead with those 20 bonus points, but I, I, I would, I think I would benefit from um, hearing what you two think about uh, the public improvements, especially um, the, the closed street. Okay, let's do that. Thank you for that suggestion. So let's turn to the comment, the, the suggestion about the public improvements and in relation in particular to the garage and the impacts on um, auto and other non-auto based movements. Who would like to go first? Member Medina, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the council designating myself and the mayor as the ad hoc committee to kind of flesh out um, these requested improvements. And I think the applicant has come a long way from the original design that we've seen. Um, I am a really big fan of having connected, protected bikeways that continue up Horton Street. Um, one thing that I do want to see that is not in here is the continuation of the Portland, the Portland cement um, from 64th to 65th Street as a protected cycle track as well. I think that is um, something that I've been extremely clear about as this being a necessary um, contiguous protected bikeway rather than doing things piecemeal. That's the entire vision here. Um, this was something that can move cyclists north to south, south to north as they're coming off of the one day um, new bike pedestrian bridge off the Ashby interchange. And I think that is a necessary component to make this project worthwhile. If that part is missing, I'm not seeing where people are coming down onto this fantastic village green between 63rd and 64th. And so that is a key component that I think is currently missing and one that I would like to see um, included in this. Additionally, I wanna, um, you know, really emphasize that BPAC made a really good point um, with the need to have a careful connection on 62nd and Hollis when it's transitioning from a two-way cycle track into that intersection on Hollis Street. Um, I think having a protected intersection design is going to be vital there. And so those are my comments about what's still needed. Um, the rest of the design, I, actually, I really think can add a lot of value to our city. This is an underutilized um, piece of asphalt, Overland Street, basically. Some cars speed down it every once in a while, and uh, it could be something that becomes part of our contiguous connected throughways for our city, which really hits our, our council goals of connectivity for active transit modes. Um, so I think there's a great deal of potential, but I really need that connectivity piece. Yeah, I, I would like to also thank the council for, after the last meeting, designating the vice mayor and I as an ad hoc um, committee to have a conversation about some of these elements. And I wanna thank the applicant uh, on this space uh, for listening to us. I think we're close to um, hearing a proposal from the applicant that meets uh, and necessitates what's being requested. So I, I, I disagree with the applicant on a couple items. Um, I disagree with the belief that the transit overlay is anachronistic and that parking minimum elimination somehow doesn't necessitate this overlay. Um, you know, the the Wareham properties in campus are one of the nicest, uh, well, most well-maintained parts of the city. Um, and Mr. Robbins does an excellent job of landscaping his spaces. Um, and there's a transit center there with a train station and a bus bays. And as was noted, there are other micro and um, shared mobility options there. Um, but as one public commenter noted, which is something I always note, um, the bike lanes in this narrow corridor have been permeated regularly by um, delivery vehicles and large uh, trucks that are going to, that, that do, that occupy spaces that are intended to be safe for active transportation users. And that has been a shortcoming through the prior designs of the Emory Station campus is how to uh, protect people on the street. So I appreciate receiving um, a proposal that provides um, separated curb separated bike lanes that will deter. Um, I think there should probably be some additional features to those, just small things, um, some some solid bollards at the fronts of those curbs to alert drivers that those curbs exist because that will become a problem if um, there isn't a bollard at the end of it, people will straddle it. Um, but I, I think that the, the proposals are, are good as it relates to Horton Street and um, 62nd Street, I share the vice mayor's belief that this project isn't really going to actually connect us if it stops a block short. Um, and so the protected cycle track that will go up Overland from 62nd to 63rd and then go through this um, open linear park space 
um, needs to move to the west side of Overland Street and connect to um, 65th as a separated cycle track so that when our bike bridge comes to 65th and Lacoste, um, we can make the connection across 65th Street and move people from the Bay Trail down through the city safely, um, avoiding one of the most notorious places in our town, which is the Powell Street underpass. This provides a safer, um, we're gonna put the quiet zones in at 65th. So this is providing a safe movement across the train tracks and the freeway for cyclists and pedestrians to the Bay Trail. Um, and it will bring people down through the center of the city to 62nd Street, which takes them across to Doyle Hollis Park and the Greenway, and then further down to the new um, Sherwin Park and the bridge. So the, the vice mayor and I, in, in having these conversations, we're really looking at trying to actually establish the full network in the city and not looking at this as a singular block or project. So I, I think that um, anything short of going to 65th Street would be a failing um, for, for this vision. and. There were some comments made by the planning commissioners. It was noted in the staff report that um, they didn't see this as being a utilized linear park. For those planning commissioners and anyone else who look at this and say, why would anyone sit there? I wanna try to help you see our vision. It's not intended to be a destination. Not all park spaces are destinations. When you are an active transportation mover with children on strollers or a family on a bike on a weekend, it's nice to stop at places that are car free and calm and quiet and have respite. It's nice to pull out a sandwich with a peanut butter, a bag with a peanut butter sandwich or some fruit snacks and have those with your kids or talk. If you're an, you know, an, an older citizen with mobility issues to have a place to sit in shade and just talk to your friends. So it's not intended to be um, a destination so much as it is to be a journey. And if you create interesting places that are people centered along pathways like this, people will start using them. And the goal is to not just put stuff that's built into our plan in the city, it's to actually design it in a way that makes it so it's used, right? And so today, nobody uses Overland Street. And if you have no vision, you wouldn't see anyone ever using it. But I see Overland Street as a street that would be used by people who want to go and do things on the Bay Trail or come to our city from other places if we design and build it in a way that's actually going to let that happen. So I think that the proposed programming for that block of Overland Street that's to be closed is acceptable. I think that Overland Street needs to be one way south um, from 65th Street. The reason being is that if you have it be one way north for the street lane that would remain, um, you'll have the conflict of having to design a signal where cars are turning left in front of bicycles also turning left where the bicycle needs to get to the outside lane. And whereas if you have just a bike, a bike light um, on the northbound side for bikes, then you don't actually have that conflict. Vehicles have a light to connect with Hollis at 60, Fourth Street in a one-way movement, so we're not actually going to harm um, the the traffic pattern. I think if we do that, and we actually create safety for people. Um, on the the last uh, point I have on the transportation um, item is that yeah, just coming back to the the transit overlay and the parking structure. Um, if you're going to propose that you need to park this many more cars, then you need to have an offset that requires that you provide this much additional infrastructure to um, protect pedestrians and cyclists. And that goes to point number two in the findings um, that there wouldn't be a harm to transit or these other things. And so I believe that this closed block, that this one way movement on Overland and that these other improvements that the vice mayor and I have um, mentioned that was largely presented by the applicant, I think that those accomplish those things. Um, so if other council members are supportive of that plan, um, we'd like to give that direction for as it relates to the public works improvements. Do others have comments or feedback on what we've discussed? I support that vision of Overland Street. I think it's uh, a good future for our city. And uh, yeah, I, I support this going forward. Thank you. Uh, Member Martinez? Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to the mayor and the vice mayor for um, uh, taking the lead on these issues. I just want to make sure that you're, I, I understand they are, but I'm just confirming that your comments are inclusive of the um, Portland cement and the protected uh, intersection design that the vice mayor had mentioned. Yes, we are on the same page about the entire project. Yep. Very good. I'm in support of your recommendations. Okay. Member Walsh, are you as well? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Um, Maru, could you please prompt me with the next question since it's not on the screen at the moment? I think at this point, it's just any other comments that you may have regarding the project design or any other comments? Yeah. Okay, well, let's take other comments before we go back to the point issue. Um, do others have comments? I have a couple other small items, but uh, do others have comments? 
No, okay, I have a couple other small items. Um, the first is I'd like to actually, I don't know if it can be a condition of approval or if we need to just get some form of uh, commitment or application rolling now so it's not a problem for us later. Uh, this is this is addressed as a 62nd Street building, and I would like the garage and the building to be addressed as a 63rd Street building, because when people come to buildings like this and they type an address in, what will happen with delivery vehicles and people who are coming to drop people off is they will drive onto 62nd Street and they will park where we're going to have a cycle track. They'll just park in the middle of the street now, and delivery people will park in this intersection in front of this beautiful courtyard that's going to be at the north end of Horton Street with this beautiful visual landscape. And the developer has actually proposed loading spaces on 63rd in front of their building. They've proposed a lobby access over there for deliveries. They have the garage over there. I think all of those design features as it relates to vehicle movement are good. I think they are all set to be undermined if the address is not moved to 63rd Street. And that requires contacting the post office to make an application to change that away from 62nd. But anyone who types a number into a GPS these days is going to go to the other location. And I think that especially if we're going to do a one way movement down Overland for that block around by the post office, it's going to create traffic problems at that three way stop. And so if others support, I would like to ask that we have staff begin the work with the applicant to ensure that we have an address change. OK, that's my first item. The other item, uh, a couple items were the north side of the garage and looking at the full application that was submitted to the Planning Commission. The north side of the garage um, is has a couple interesting components to it. They include planters that hang from the garage essentially that have some plants, but there aren't very many of them. Whereas the other three sides of the garage are surrounded by buildings. This side of the garage will have uh, sunlight most of the time and it is faces a street with a, no building right across from it. So I think that we just like to, I'd like to give feedback, maybe just myself even, that I think the developers should propose a new visual design that includes much more greenscaping on the north side of the parking garage because it is a very long, big building with very few um, uh, interesting pieces on it. Whereas I think the, the building itself with the terraces, the terraces are, I think, an excellent feature to that building. And I think they could be complemented better with um, additional pieces on the garage on the north side. Um, I just want to confirm with staff, this building will be using bird safe building design glass. And it's yes. correct. Yes, yes it will be complying with our regulations. Okay. Um, yeah, and then the only other comment I have is on the art walk. Uh, so where I, where I live at the Blue Star Corner, it's uh, four story buildings that are all in very close proximity to one another. And we have a very lush vegetative gardens and muse between our buildings. And I would just encourage that I saw images along the art walk that had these very small like ferns at a ground level. And I think that it, people who are gonna live in these artist cooperative buildings don't wanna look at the back of a garage. It would actually be nice to consider putting in some um, lush landscaping in a narrow space like that, that would actually do well in a largely shaded area. Those types of um, spaces do work and exist with vegetation. Um, so I, I just want to offer that as feedback. I think that there more could be done based on the visuals I've seen for the art walk. The last point I have is that the, closing the art walk off to the public is a request that has come from the developer before um, with the, with the, uh, transit center building, they wanted the second story podium to have a gate on it. And um, then council member West really pushed against that, uh, wanted to ensure that that was publicly accessible at all times of the day. And so I'd like to ask, you know, the applicants, since the public facing side of open space is this mid block crossing that will have no landscaping or vegetation in it, is the applicant um, opposed to um, removing their request to have private gates to close the art walk off and allowing that to be accessible if um, that was going to be helpful to getting the support for the 20 points. Maybe Claudia or one of the members of that team could answer that question. Mr. I Robinson. would like to. It's, I would just like to say I think it's been misunderstood. The only time we would close it off is for security reasons late at night till early in the morning. That was the whole purpose. Okay, but so it wouldn't I, be open from 11 p.m. to you know 6 a.m. something of that nature. And by the way, the mid-block crossing does have landscaping. We have that in all our spots okay. and, and traverses. Okay, I think a condition that limits the hours for closure, I think, specific, specifies that it's something that could be acceptable. Uh, Member Donahue, do you have a question on that? Well, just that I'm thinking that uh, police typically are 
wanting to see spaces like this when they drive by. And maybe uh, there's some technical fix on this. When a police car drives by, they all of a sudden come into range of a video cam that shows them the space, uh, you know, in the car so they can see, oh, there's people in there, there's no people in there. You know, in, in other words, uh, there, there could be a relatively easy technological fix to increase public safety in that kind of a place. Okay, we can ask the applicant to just put some time into thinking about that. Mr. Bryant? Yes, I just wanted to comment that this was one of the early comments of the police department on this project uh, was that they were not comfortable with the art walk being open to the public 24-7 uh, mainly because of that issue of not being able to see into it as they go by in their patrol cars. So that's, I, I believe the applicant originally proposed that as part of the open space for bonus points. And we discouraged them from that uh, because of that issue, but it can still be counted as a uh, common open space for their tenants uh, and then closed off to the public as Mr. Uh, um, Robin said, okay. during the nighttime hours. Okay, I think if we could see a condition of approval that has outlines what those hours are, that would be helpful. So members returning to um, the last couple items here, one, is there anyone else who has additional comments on the project at all that they'd like to provide? No, okay. And do folks then, going back to the question we deferred, do folks agree that the 20 points of open space can be met with the mid block crossing and the courtyard proposed, Mr. Bryant? I just wanted to make one further point that I just remembered, which I believe is mentioned in the staff report. Uh, in order to get 20 bonus points for open space, they have to dedicate 5% uh, of the site area to public open space. And this proposal would actually dedicate 7% of the site area to public open space. So they could uh, eliminate even uh, a portion at least of the northern part of the mid block uh, crossing a mid block path and still have enough open space to earn 20 points. Thank you. And I would note that I want to appreciate the applicant and their presentation for noting that their courtyard in front of their building will is intended to be all publicly accessible, which I think uh, to me is a is a benefit and a good feature for that particular building in that space. So I saw a thumbs up from I think almost everybody. Was there anybody who did not support the open space requirement or proposal for points? Okay, and um, we've given feedback on what we think would justify the parking structure um, in terms of what minimum infrastructure for uh, public works. I would like to just ask if Ms. Capio, would you like to uh, let us know if there's any additional questions you'd like to have answered before your uh, study session essentially opportunity is over? Yes, thank you. I, I don't have any, but do, does Warren, do Richard, Jeff? Sure. Mr. Robbins, do you have any questions that you'd like to have answered that we haven't answered for you? Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bowders, I think you've answered all the questions and I think you've given us great feedback and we'll be happy to respond to some of the suggestions that have been made. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. Okay, seeing no additional comment, that will close item 12.2 and bring us to item 12.3 on our agenda, which is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Emeryville authorizing the City Manager to enter into a contract with Brannon Corporation in an amount of $820,000 for the construction of the Point Emery Shoreline Project. This is uh, Vice Mayor Medina's favorite project at Transportation Committee. So I am gonna uh, welcome her favorite person to report on this, which is Mr. Roberts, and um, ask if you'd like to give a presentation. Yes. Uh Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, Michael Roberts, uh, Senior Civil Engineer with the Public Works Department, uh, giving a short presentation about uh, the Point Emory Shoreline Protection Project. Um, as you know, uh, Point Emory Park is in the very north uh, west corner of the city. Uh, next slide, please. And um, it's a very popular park. Every time I've been out there to do kind of site uh, studies, it's the, the parking is full on um, this particular day that I took these photos. There was a family using swimming at the beach and folks down at the end of the point, the Western point uh, fishing under a orange uh, umbrella, sun umbrella, uh, very popular, very well used and loved. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what is occurring at Point Emory is that uh, 
due to just uh, two high tides a day and uh, severe storm weather, uh, it's eroding as much as 10 feet laterally along the uh, longitudinal uh, parts of the park. Um, and uh, exposing this kind of rubble left behind, uh, mostly concrete, asphalt, and brick. Uh, next slide, please. So what this project proposes to do is uh, to repair uh, those field areas and protect those the, the rest of the point. Um, uh, what will be installed will be some uh, gravel in the scoured areas and then uh, large uh, boulders, otherwise known as riprap, uh, around the entire point to protect it from storm damage. Um, there'll be improvements to the existing pathway out there uh, to improve it to ADA standards and it will be installing uh, two benches uh, along the point and um, some uh, dogway stations, as well as informational signage for board sailors, uh, board sailing safety. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are just some uh, cross sections of what, what's going to be installed. Uh, the top image is uh, where, where there is no gravel fill installed. It's just the riprap. Uh, the, the lower slide shows where we have Gravel fill will be in, on top of that gravel. We'll be installing some planting soil, we'll get some planting in there, hopefully to root in and stabilize uh, the area. And then riprap will go on top of that. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, here, uh, sections of the fill that will go in. Essentially, the, the top of the fill will be uh, roughly the same um, as the existing ground surface. And this, uh, this elevation was selected, designed to, to meet a 100-year standing water level uh, of plus 9.9 .9 feet. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, another major part of this project is beach cleaning uh, that's been required and uh, we're glad to do. We'll be removing all that rubble that we saw in those previous slides, as well as uh, getting out further into the, the water to remove any uh, concrete debris rubble uh, in these uh, five different beach clean zones. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as far as a project timeline, um, we initially applied with BCDC back in May of 2019. We were approved this summer, um, July 15th. Um, we did this project out in January and uh, hoping to award tonight uh, after, after award. Uh, sometime next month, we'll be doing a eelgrass survey to make sure we map and understand exactly where uh, eelgrass is, which is known to be a feeding ground for salmon. Um, and then construction will start in June and be complete sometime in the fall 2022. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Do members have questions for Mr. Roberts? I just have one on the eelgrass survey. Is it to just do a survey? Is it just a requirement as part of a BCDC permit to do a survey as to what exists or are we assessing it for the need to replace anything? Um, it'll be mapped and uh, before and after to make sure that there, no damage occurs to the eelgrass, the existing eelgrass. Uh, you know, if barges are floated in, make sure that those barges avoid the eelgrass. If it can't be avoided, then then we'll maybe need to make some repairs or, or mitigating uh, the grass that's damaged. Okay, that's super helpful to know. Okay, members of the public who wish to comment on this item will have two minutes to do so. Sherry, did we receive any written comment cards? We did not. Okay, we have one hand raised. Please um, promote Brian Donahue to speaking for two minutes. Good evening. Okay, so I'm gonna call the five of you the, the, the name that you called me and council, former council member, John Fricke, uh, you're now, uh, this epithet is now on you and you guys, what you are disgusting, or I think, no, it's not more than disgusting. It was, uh, despicable ableists because you took away a handicapped parking spot tonight. Uh, 
back when we suggested you obey the the Emeryville regulations, your own regulations, to uh, not put in a handicapped spot, you called us despicable ableists. And now that now that you're taking one away, you ha you now own this. You are now despicable ableist. So I the, the flip right back on the five of you. Bounce off of me, and now it's on you. Despicable ableists. Are there any other members of the public who wish to comment on the Rip Rap Point Emory project? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to discussion. I'd like to recognize the vice mayor. Thank you. First of all, Mr. Roberts, you are exemplary at PowerPoint presentation. That was phenomenal. There were no large blocks of texts. You did not simply read off of the screen. You conveyed the information through use of visual aid masterfully. I commend you. I thank you. Fantastic on the PowerPoint presentation, which as you might know, is a particular bone of mine. Uh, second of all, I am so excited for this project. Thank you for navigating the most complex bureaucratic process uh, imaginable. Uh, for those of you who are newer to council like Courtney, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers are involved in this project. Every single agency you could conceive of has now had to review this project. Uh, when I was on Parks and Rec Committee in 2016, it was when I first heard about this project. And finally, and finally, it is going forward. So Mike Roberts, thank you for your tenacity. Thank you for not retiring before this project is over. Thank you for bringing us the rip rap. Me Member Martinez. Um, also kudos on the PowerPoint, but I, I just want to um, thank all of the public works staff, um, not the least of which Mike Roberts for hanging in there on a project that required the same um, uh, agencies that are overseeing the activities at Howard Terminal. So <laughs> we're just, we were, uh, I know that I, as a council member, I'm very grateful um, for what you do and not to mention um, the rest of staff and any committee member who's had to comment um, on this. It, it's taken a lot longer than any of us anticipated um, when we first uh, started talking about shoring up this park. Thank you, Member Donahue. Uh, I am just so happy as a swimmer to know that I will not be stubbing my toes any longer as I'm wading out. That is fabulous that there's going to be this general cleanup into the water where, you know, at uh, sort of a medium tide level, we won't be tripping any further. So our, our good swimming beach is going to be even better. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'm sure he says you're welcome too. Um, Member Walsh, did you have anything to add? <laughs> no? I have to just say, share in uh, the excitement with my fellow council members. And I just want to thank Mr. Roberts. Um, although I don't know that I need to thank him because every time he comes to transportation committee, um, Vice Mayor Medina is so excited when she sees that we will talk about riprap. Um, I'm sure he has a he has a, a serotonin boost every time he leaves the committee because she has been so ecstatic about this. So I understand that this project has a very specific start time, which is I think June 15th under the BCDC permit, and it is uh, not going to be a long project. It'll be done by the end of summer. So uh, we will we will have a Point Emory um, rededication, I think, in the fall. I think we will do something to get everybody out to Point Emory in the fall. It sounds like a good idea. So I look forward to that project. And with that, members, there is a contract that's set to be uh, approved tonight. Would somebody like to make the motion? I'd love to move approval. OK. Thank it. Yeah, a motion by Vice Mayor Medina and a second by Member Donahue to approve this contract. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue. Aye. Council Member Martinez. Aye. Council Member Welch. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. That resolution is approved. Item 12.4 is a resolution of the City Council related to making the findings for continuation of a remotely held meetings pursuant to Assembly Bill 361. There is no presentation. Um, the findings remain the same as they have been in the prior meetings. Members of the public wish to comment on this item. We'll have one minute to do so. I see no hands. Did we receive any comments, Sherry? We did not. 
Okay, comment is closed. Is there discussion? Seeing none, is there a motion? I move comments? approval. Okay. Second. Okay, thank you. There's a motion by Member Donahue and a second by Member Martinez to approve this resolution. Please call the roll. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Council Member Welch? Aye. Vice Mayor Medina? Aye. And Mayor Bowers? Aye. Okay, members, that takes us to item 13, which is the department head reports. Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Mayor Bowders. Um, this is my report on the last planning commission meeting on March 24th. There were five items on the agenda as are listed here on your agenda. I will note that all seven commissioners were present at the meeting. However, Commissioner Dram arrived late at about 8 p.m. because he had a prior commitment. So he did arrive uh, about halfway through the fourth item on the agenda. Uh, so there were two public hearings. The first was uh, the Bayview Master Sign Program. That's for uh, the 6701 Shell Mound Apartment Project currently under construction. That was approved uh, unanimously, six to nothing with uh, Count Commissioner Dram absent. Um, next was the Nora Davis Transit Center sign at the Amtrak station. Vice Chair Mendez was recused on this item and uh, Com Com Commissioner Dram was still absent. That was approved unanimously on a vote of five to zero with those two not participating. Uh, then there were three study sessions. First was uh, the 4300 San Pablo Avenue intergenerational affordable housing project, which as you know, is an SB 35 AB 1763 project. So it will be subject to staff level ministerial approval. Um, the uh, commission uh, did discuss this project and was generally supportive of it. Uh, next was a study session on the Emory Station Overland project. I will note that two commissioners, Commission, uh, Vice Chair Mendez and uh, Commissioner Chafe were recused on that item. Commissioner Dram was still absent when we started this item, but we still had a quorum of four uh, commissioners to discuss it. And he did arrive uh, about, as I said, about halfway through this discussion. Uh, Miru uh, has previously given you a pretty extensive discussion uh, or uh, description of the commission's comments earlier tonight. So I won't go into that any further. And then finally, um, there was a study session on the Bay Center Life Science Project, which is a new uh, 210,000 square foot research and development building on uh, Lacoste and 64th Street. Um, in that case, uh, Chair Keller was recused because he lives nearby and Commissioners Men uh, Vice Chair Mendez and Commissioner Bizzoni were recused because of uh, business conflict. So that left a quorum of uh, four commissioners present for that item. And because both the chair and the vice chair were recused under the commission's rules, they elected a presiding officer for the item, which was Commissioner Chafe. And the uh, commission then uh, had a discussion and generally supported with a number of constructive suggestions on that project. Um, I would note that the two items that were approved at the public hearings, the master sign program for the Bayview project and the Nora Davis Transit Center sign are both appealable to the city council. And the appeal deadline is this coming Friday, April 8th at 4 p.m. Obviously, if the council wishes to appeal either of these items to yourselves, this would be your opportunity to do that. And that concludes my report. I'll be happy to respond to any questions. Okay, thank you. First, we'll take questions. Member Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Charlie, do you know if the applicant had um, contact with the Davis family um, regarding the Nora Davis Transit Center sign? I do not know. That was not indicated in the application or in the presentation. Okay, thank you. Others with questions? No, okay. Item 13.1A uh, is appealable to the City Council. Is there any member from the City Council who wishes to propose appealing it to have a discussion? Okay, seeing none. Item 13.1B is appealable to the City Council. Does any member of the City Council wish to discuss or uh, appeal this to the City Council? Okay, seeing none. That concludes the um, Planning Commission or the Planning Department update. Madam City Manager, is there any other department head who wishes to provide a report tonight? There are none, thank you. Okay, 
So that brings us members to item 14, which is future agenda item requests from the members of the council. I'll start with member Donahue. Do you have any future agenda item requests right now? The answer is no. Member Welch? No. Member Medina? No. Member Martinez? No. Okay, there are no future item re uh, requests from the council this evening. Members, that brings us to adjournment. The time is 9.05 p.m. Thank you for uh, getting through a lot of work tonight. And uh, everybody go outside and enjoy your week. Cheers.